Yeah, do you want to do this? <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> Just load, load it. Unfortunately, well, yeah, actually, we can do it now because these don't just want to go.
So this this thing works now. Thank you for surviving the night. For those of you who uh, took off after the seafood and decided to have your own uh, conversations in places with other imbibements. So uh, glad to see you here early. Um, yesterday was exciting for all of us. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that uh, later. But I want to do a little housekeeping. Um, for those of you who did take the vans out, they will be leaving again right after the last session uh, of the afternoon and taking you back to the hotel. We thank you for uh, helping us decrease the amount of vehicles coming in, and that's been great. Um, and then, uh, so the other thing you do need to know is that as the rest of you, today is a Saturday, the university is closed, so the doors automatically lock. So if these doors will be staying open and the front will be staying open, but if you're outside and for some reason you get behind a door and it, you just walked out and it was open and now it's closed, just continue walking around the building. You'll, <laughs> you'll find a room somewhere or a grad student hanging out that'll <laughs> let you in. Um, I just don't want anyone being, being locked out too much. Uh, we do have uh, some breakfast out here for you as well. And then again, during the break, there'll be some stuff and then we'll have a great lunch again. You're gonna have a box lunch coming in and Hog Island Oyster Bar is gonna be out here serving some oysters up again. So it's gonna be really nice. Uh, for you guys this afternoon. Um, and then we, we do have our morning session, then we have our afternoon session. There's been quite a bit of sponsors here uh, doing this. So the afternoon session is, um, is going to be, it's co-sponsored, basically. It's, Lyft Economy is running the afternoon session, and it's gonna be co-moderated, sorry. Um, one by Aaron Axelrod from <coughs> Lyft Economy, and they've been a great sponsor for this event, and you'll see that in the afternoon panel. And also Mike Murphy, which I, I didn't get to describe much yesterday. Mike's been instrumental in, in what he's been doing to help us uh, promote this and, and help us from all directions uh, get a lot of you here, I think. A lot of you are here because he was uh, trying to con convince you you needed to be here. Um, and you know he's consulting with Pharmacy, but just doing really great things in the background to, uh, to make this seaweed and shellfish stuff happen. So I want to thank Mike, Mike Murphy as well. He'll be moderating the second <laughs> afternoon uh, session. Um, and then after that, you guys are free to go, right? There's, we don't have anything special planned after the last session, so if you want to mingle and hang out and talk, you know, the lab's still here. We'll be cleaning up, um, but we don't, we don't necessarily want to rush you guys out. But we do want to uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and then the morning session, I'm going to invite up the sponsor for the morning session uh, right now, um, and that's uh, Save Our Shores and Executive Director uh, Catherine O'Day, who wants to come up and, and say some words.
That was an awesome and unpredicted segue into what I wanted to say. I mean, to have uh, the executive director of Save Our Shores make those, um, I think, pretty profound comments is, uh, is great. And what it does is it tells us what yesterday was. So what was yesterday, right? We've been working on this for a long time to get this going. Um, and I, I want, I just gonna make some observations yesterday. Um, Mark Stone, Assemblyman made certain observations, and I think some of the rest of us have, have we all probably have our own observations what happened. One thing we, we observed yesterday or we heard, which we already know, is we're consuming regardless. We're consuming. The, the ocean resources are being consumed, right? Maybe not by all of us in this room, but clearly by the United States consumer. It's happening. It's happening all over the United States, and it's not going to stop. I mean, I think Michael King's comments yesterday were true. I mean, he, he fills his restaurant with whoever just wants to eat seafood, and it's going to continue to happen. All right, so that's number one. We're consuming. The U.S. is gearing up. They're gearing up because money's becoming available. Certain regions are becoming a little bit more open. So we're consuming, and the United States, I think, is getting ready to start to invest and start to demand aquaculture development. California's going slow. I'm not saying stalled, but it's going slower. Right? That was another thing that came up. And it came up, it came up from the people who are involved in helping do it. I mean, it's a slow process. Right? Um, we all would like to see that speed up, but based on our values. Nobody said ditch California's regulatory mission. Nobody said we want massive salmon farms sitting offshore of Malibu 
right? Where everyone's going, that's not what was said yesterday. What was said was we'd like to speak it, speed it up, but we want to speed it up with California's values intact, right? And I think that was pretty, I mean, I'm at least getting most head nods up and down, but that's right. <laughs> so then I'm left with, okay, so what, what do you do, right? The last thing that was promoted was local. All right, we're going to consume the seafood. If we do not do anything, we will continue to bring in 91% of our seafood from outside of the United States. Clearly, more than that, outside of California. So the reality is we're going to consume, right? And, and, and if we hold a really strong um, uh, con restraint on development within California, because it has to meet certain criteria, as Catherine was potentially saying, that might even be stronger than what we hold any of our other products going to then California will slow down. Yet California is the fifth largest economy on the planet. California has these values that when we apply them to agriculture, when we apply them to, to other industries, we export those services, we export those values. Um, and yesterday we heard that the, the probably the largest sucking sound on the planet is the Chinese middle class. They're not buying the cheap stuff. They're buying the stuff with the value. And yet California is famous for making things with value. And so I think what I'm like sitting here now is local means something completely different. Local doesn't just mean I don't want to have to ship my seaweed to New York, right, because it's of the carbon footprint. Local means I want the jobs here, I want the values here, I want my kids to go down to my seaweed farm. I was telling Terry, sorry, I want him to be able to know what his oyster shell looks like because he's my neighborhood oyster uh, uh, farm and they can go down there and experience it, right? And then uh, th that changes the way I think we deal with our seafood. Um, and then we no longer, I mean, I'm still gonna eat oysters, right? I'm still gonna eat fish, and if we're not gonna do it, I'm still gonna eat it, right? And so now I'm stuck saying, I want to have seafood that has this quality, I'm still gonna eat it, California's not gonna do it for me, so I'm gonna bring it in from China or Indonesia or India, where I don't know where the value system is. So local is, I think we, it, it's becoming clear that Californians want seafood, right? We want to be producing seafood, but we also want to be producing with our values, and I think others want our values as well. So today's kind of cool, because yesterday was big, and we all talked about it. Today you're going to hear about it. We're going to have two perspectives. One, in the morning right now, we're going to have a perspective for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's something we can do now. We're not going to potentially be talking about what's going to happen with large offshore farms. We're just going to be talking about what's available in the sanctuary now and what's currently happening under the current regulatory environment. Then in the afternoon, we're gonna hear um, uh, just a really dynamic discussion from the seaweed um, shellfish kind of group, but mostly the seaweed group, which has got, I mean, you know, they've even quoted me, and I promise you I've never said this, but they've quoted me as saying, you know, that kelp is the new kale, right? It's, it's the KK <laughs> thing. I've never said that in my life, but I get quoted by it. Um, and I actually don't even farm kelp, right? You know, I, I farm other seaweeds. Um, but the, the reality is that, that wave's moving, and it's moving across the U.S., it's moving across the world, and we've got a bunch of young entrepreneurs here in California that are excited, trying to get involved, and I think this afternoon's gonna be really cool because you're gonna hear from a lot of them, whether they're actually selling uh, seaweed themselves or selling products or trying to get involved in dealing with the products. So you're gonna hear today about local, and that's what we wanna do. So to lead that off, I'm gonna bring in our first speaker, which is um, Paul Michel, who uh, is the, um, the head of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and he's gonna come up and give us the perspective of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary on aquaculture. And let me get you going here. There we go, I'm getting my coffee out of your way. Why don't you leave it? Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I'm Paul Michelle, superintendent uh, of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which means basically that I know very little about a lot of things. And uh, aquaculture is one of these. Uh, we just don't deal with a lot of aquaculture here in the Marine Sanctuary, but it's a big deal for NOAA. Uh, and I, I think to understand you know, what the opportunity is in the Marine Sanctuary, you first have to know, you know what is the sanctuary. You know, we'll start there, why it was designated, why it's important. Uh, then understand what our regulations say about aquaculture or what uh, aquaculture might trigger in our regulations, and then look at the very few real aquaculture that's occurring in the marine sanctuary to get a picture of, of what it's like today. Um, so what I thought I would do is just quickly, for those that are, are 
not aware of what the marine sanctuary is. It, we, you know, we're a network of uh, 13 national marine sanctuaries and a couple of marine monuments. Altogether, the sanctuary program and marine monuments protect over 600,000 square miles of ocean. So this is a huge enterprise. It's, it's you know, more than all of our national parks and state parks put together. Um, and you know, the different sites are designated for different purposes. There's some maritime heritage sites. There's sites like ours that have this huge coastline and land-sea connection and deal with a lot of complicated issues. Um, but we're a network of marine protected areas, essentially. And these are our nation's you know, most treasured uh, coast, uh, marine, and Great Lakes areas. So here we have a, a big one. This is the second largest national marine sanctuary, uh, second only to American Samoa, which uh, is really big. Uh, we have five coastal counties, 12 coastal cities. You know, we have a bunch of congressional districts. About 10 million people live within 25 miles of the coast. And we have multiple sectors that are occurring here along the coast with tourism and recreation, agriculture, research, education, technology. Uh, it's a hustling, bustling place. And, and really our job uh, in this environment is to try to manage all that activity uh, you know, with this umbrella of resource protection. A lot of people refer to this area as the Serengeti of the sea, and I love that term because this place right offshore here and up and down the coast from Marin to Cambria and even farther up, up coast in California is just a biodiverse hotspot, and it is a, a highly productive marine ecosystem. I mean, that's why this place was designated a marine sanctuary, not only to uh, curtail oil and gas development, which was the leading reason to designate it, but it was designated because it is so special so amazing, so productive, and so diverse. And our job is, you know, I, I like it more to a national forest than a national park because, you know, national forests allow things like silviculture and, and mining and hunting and things, but it, with this resource protection overview. And so marine sanctuaries are similar. We allow multiple uses to occur, but what this with resource protection overview. So. You know, we manage multiple sectors. Uh, we conduct and facilitate research and monitoring. Uh, we do a lot with uh, involving and informing the public with visitor centers and advisory councils. We're a very sort of out there, uh, open, public, transparent uh, agency. Uh, and what we do is science-based. And I'm realizing now that we are on the wrong slideshow. Because it starts the same way. So can we get out of this one and open the other one? It on the other, yeah. on the disc? Yeah, I mean, I could do this, I could do this talk too. Yeah. Huh. Well, that was fun. Oh, there. Sorry about that. So what's Wellfest? So, Wellfest is an annual event we do in Monterey. It's all rain and uh, whales. And Oh, this is as a PDF. It's as a PDF file, though, not a PPT. That's why. You can still do it. Still do it. Okay, just want to make sure that was that was the reason, probably why it was came up that way. I have a whole library of different presentations. <laughs> All right, better. That's the one. <laughs> Sorry about that. See, they kind of, few slides. <laughs> it's kind of similar, right? Yes. And then I get to the one, I'm like, oh, we are in the right church, sitting in the wrong pew. Okay, so, let me, um, so let's get right into, you know, what NOAA has to say about aquaculture. You know, I work for NOAA. The Marine Sanctuary sit within uh, NOAA and the Department of Commerce. And NOAA's, you know, they're gung-ho on aquaculture. Um, and, and that's great. And, and so I think what we're going to try to understand here this morning is what's NOAA say about aquaculture? You know, what, what regulations do we have that might um, affect aquaculture in the sanctuary? So NOAA aquaculture policy, uh, you know, basically encourages and supports responsible, sustainable, safe aquaculture, uh, all about providing domestic jobs and products and services, uh, protecting wild species and healthy, productive, and resilient coastal ocean ecosystems advancing scientific knowledge, uh, aquaculture w that will come out of timely and unbiased aquaculture management decisions, uh, and it supports innovation. Uh, so we have these wonderful things called prohibitions and regulations in the marine sanctuary. Uh, there's about a dozen 
dozen or so um, prohibitions. Jeez, that's all. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Keep. Apologies. Keep talking. That's right. So um, the we we call them the big three, the, the, the big three prohibitions that you can never get a permit for. So these are things that just are not allowed ever, ever, ever. And that's oil and gas developed. That's uh, new dredged. <laughs> oh, Like I'm above myself looking down. <laughs> this is like an alternative it's just, reality. <laughs> I can't stop it. That's okay. You know, let's. I tell you what. Let's, let, let's let it. We'll let it do its thing, and I'll do my thing. Okay. Yeah, these minute cards don't apply anymore. <laughs> All right, I'm talking about our prohibitions and regulations. I think, I it's, only, I think it's only when it gets to this slide. It starts freaking out. People freak out when they look at regulations. <laughs> so even slideshows. So I was saying we have these three main prohibitions, no oil and gas development, no uh, new dredge disposal sites, and no new uh, primary sewage outfalls. Okay? Our other regulations uh, uh, that are, are stated, you can apply for a permit for, but they have to be uh, projects that mainly are research oriented or education oriented or what we call management permits that allow us to go and do things in the sanctuary. So, well, we have a couple of uh, regs that would apply to aquaculture as I've waded through this. Uh, discharge or depositing material, that's anything, from, you know, a, a pipe or non-point source pollution or throwing your Coke can in the, in the water, that's a no-no. No discharge, no depositing material. There are some exceptions in the regulations uh, related to uh, ships and fishing and vessel wash, things like that. Um, so that, that would apply to aquaculture. Um, introducing or releasing an introduced or non-native species, uh, but for commercial shellfish aquaculture in state waters, certified as non-invasive by the state. So what this means is that if we had a proposed shellfish project, aquaculture project, that was a non-native species, we would work with our state partner uh, in state wa if the project is in state waters, which it probably would be, uh, and to determine, and the state would have to certify that uh, this uh, non-native species is non-invasive. Okay? And in that, in that situation, we can permit a, a commercial shellfish aquaculture project. Some regs exempt aquaculture outright. So possessing, moving, removing, uh, or injuring a historical resource, I don't know why, it seems kind of weird, I guess, if there was some aquaculture project that incidentally affected some historical resource that's exempt. Um, I'd have to go back into the EIS and read why that's done that way. The other, the other uh, reg that exempts aquaculture is disturbing or altering the seabed. So um, we can actually permit, uh, we can actually look at that, but we can't look at that actually. Any kind of pro project that's anchored or tethered to the seafloor is exempt from our regulation. So in, in conclusion, you know, for commercial native species, uh, seabed disturbance is exempt. Discharge, we can regulate or permit. Introduced, non-native is a prohibited but can allow for non-invasive shellfish in state waters if certified by the state if the species is non-invasive. And then for research and education, we can and do regulate. Uh, for example, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, you know, they have, they're basically raising marine organisms, but they're not selling them for consumption, at least, at least we hope not, um, but uh, we regulate their discharge permits and their intake uh, facilities. So that's kind of where we are with, with, with that. Um, you know, NOAA seeks to work with federal and state partners to provide the resources and expertise needed to address the challenging faces, their challenges facing aquaculture. Uh, NOAA is seeking to work internationally a lot going on in other cultures, uh, I mean, in other countries, as you know, uh, to learn best practices, uh, integrate our tribal, uh, local, state, regional, federal priorities along with commercial priorities into marine aquaculture siting and management, and ensure aquaculture development is considered within other existing and potential marine uses. That sounds all like 
like marine spatial planning kind of thing, like where's the best place to do this, working with uh, all, all, all interested parties. Uh, for us, we will consider proposed aquaculture projects based on our regulations that apply um, and in coordination with our agency partners. And so, you know, we're open to considering projects. Uh, you know, uh, when you look at what's really happening here already in the sanctuary, it's really only two uh, abalone uh, uh, projects. One, you know, is under the wharf in uh, Monterey, and the other one's up in Davenport. So we just haven't seen a lot of uh, aquaculture uh, proposed projects here in the sanctuary, um, but that's not to say that it, it's, it couldn't be viable. So anyway, that, I just want to be short and quick because my favorite slide is. <laughs> well, I got here. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. So, now we started a little late, but that was that was nice and concise. So we actually have time for a couple questions. Yes, sir. That's Tony Watt, professional aquaculture. Um, you mentioned that there uh, was a way to put non-native species shellfish in the, uh, in, uh, in situations in the sanctuary. Um, if the same criteria was met for fin fish, would that be uh, possible? In other words, if you could um, come up with the criteria where it wouldn't be have an impact, then um, or is it just as shellfish? Just shellfish. If it's a non-native. So our, we have a regulation of prohibition against introduced species. So if it's an introduced non-native species, right, it's prohibited. Yeah. Right, but for shellfish. Okay, so and only clarification. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where that, but I want to. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so just two clarification questions. Mm -hmm. Just on that, but for shellfish, is that limited to the shellfish species that have already been introduced, like the Gastrodon and um, or would it mean like if another non-native shellfish species came in? So that would be, it, it's so only it for commercial, uh, for commercial, for selling. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. But I was wondering if you can say, but for shellfish, it's really just, but for the non-native species that are, you know, were already introduced in this region, they're being raised commercially. Mm -hmm. This one's at a natural ice, and then there's shellfish from all over. Right. Can you bring shellfish from all over? Uh, well, this is a good segue. He's, we <laughs> just said, he probably is going to pick it up on yeah. the next okay. talk. Yeah. yeah. That means that, yes, that, that, that you are allowed. We are, are allowed. yes. But they're not allowed to say anything about we're not, it. We're not good. We can't. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't. <laughs> so there's really two, let me see if I can summarize. So there's, there's really two main uh, you know, impacts from aquaculture that, right. that we see in, in our regulations. It's discharge, it's seabed disturbance. Right. So we, seabed disturbance is exempt from our regulation so that we wouldn't, we can't regulate that. That's something that we have give, you know, basically given, but we do uh, regulate and uh, permit the discharge aspect of that. And if I could add to you that. forbid seabed disturbance. I mean, if there's no negotiations. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's basically allowed. It's allowed. Yes. But for for, for but commercial any, aquaculture. Any project is going to have to go through the environmental permitting process sure. to get a quarter So we have one more question over here from Neil. Sorry, it, it still wasn't clear to me. If it was a native fin fish species, yes. would that be allowed? Or are those? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, just uh, explanation, the Kapachi farm in Hawaii is inside the National Marine Sanctuary there for a humpback whale. Mm -hmm. It's a mile inside of the boundary right. there. We went through the whole yeah. marine sanctuary review process. Right. <laughs> Partially due to me. Yeah, I know. I know. Unfortunately. <laughs> Good part. <laughs> All right. So next up, I already know your name. Just don't have your title, Randy. <laughs> so next up, so now we've heard the sanctuary perspective, and then we're going to hear how the state works with the sanctuary to to consider. So we have Randy Lovell from uh, California Department of Fish and Game, state regulatory perspective, and how it interacts. With It's story time again. <laughs> uh, anybody here who was not here yesterday? Raise your hand. All right. So 
Um, we talked a little bit about regulations yesterday in a statewide perspective, and um, we talked a little bit about unintended consequences, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves just yet. So, anybody? <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're on the same page. Uh, this is, of course, Pacific Oyster, world's most widely cultured and commercially important oyster. What else is it? Senator species. All right, let's play it again. This one? Really nice catch. What else? Full of mercury. <laughs> so, I, I, I picked this. Why? Less raised than aquaculture. Yes. <laughs> why, uh, why is it important that we're thinking about this? Um, it's because uh, if you happen to be on a fishing trip out here in the sanctuary and you landed one of these, and I apologize, I work for Fish and Wildlife and I don't know the lower size limit on <laughs> striped bass, whether it's 15 or 18 inches, but striped bass was introduced into California in the 1870s. But it's established here. It's still an introduced species. So if you caught that fish and landed it and brought it on your boat and you measured it and you thought, oh, it's undersized, I gotta let it go. And you put it back in the water, you have just put, you have introduced an introduced species into the sanctuary water. So, introduced species is a term that got caught up in some of the early terms of designation for various sanctuaries. And I'm no expert on federal rules, but I became one to a certain extent a few years back when we started talking about a, a new rule having to do with introduced species and the prohibitions against them in the, in the sanctuaries. And there's an interaction with the state because it's in state waters. I won't go into the whole backstory, but I just simply want to reinforce this, this notion that there's a difference between introduced species and invasive species. First off, introduced is a factual determination. It's, a, it's an objective uh, black and white determination. We also talk about native or non-native or alien species. But invasive species are subjective determination. It's a it's found, it's, we draw a line somewhere on a continuum. And that continuum is, is uh, based on the concept of harm. This is not my definition. This is the definition from the National Invasive Species Council. And it was reinforced by presidential executive order back in the Clinton administration. Uh, but it, it's tied to uh, an introduction that's likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Again, by whose measure do we consider that harm to be significant? It's an unresolved question that perhaps needs to stay that way in uh, changing ocean conditions, changing societal values, different project particulars. But um, it just, I, I think the point that I want to make here is that when we come up with new rules, we need to really be careful because words matter. And, and Paul and his colleagues at the other sanctuaries and the state parties, we spent a lot of time trying to work this out. And it's, uh, it's arrived at what I feel, um, and I think, Paul, you expressed it very well in terms of a probably surprising to some of you concept that aquaculture actually is an activity that can be allowed and, and permitted in the sanctuaries. Um, the other thing that I want to... Um, and, and this, I, I put it up here just to show how complex some of these regulations are, and it was obvious just from us trying to talk about it and explain it. But uh, the prohibitions regarding introduced species do not apply to any activity that's authorized by the state or federal or other local authority of competent jurisdiction. So basically what it's saying is that if an activity like aquaculture is permitted by the state, or some other local authority that has that authority, then the sanctuary um, 
uh, can exempt that prohibition that they have built into their regulations. And they can, uh, it's not all just what's embedded in the federal regulations. Uh, what was the upshot is that we, I'm getting ahead of myself or behind myself. Uh, this is it. They, they have the authority to allow the introduction, but it's got to be consistent with a process that we have laid down in a memorandum of agreement. So the, the memorandum of agreement took many years for us to, to get figured out, and it's basically um, uh, documenting process by which the federal and state agencies will figure out how, how we're going to be consistent with, with some uh, oversight or some determination for a, for a particular project. And this is all in the context of introduced species. And it is limited to shellfish because that's all we were talking about at the time. This uh, agreement is, the, the parties to this agreement uh, are NOAA's uh, National Marine Sanctuaries, Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and then the long list of state parties, the Natural Resources Agency, Secretary Laird was here yesterday. Ocean Protection Council, which is a subset of that agency, our Fish and Game Commission, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife Coastal Commission, State Lands Commission, all are signatories to this agreement. And this agreement was executed in uh, 2016 and uh, will expire in 2020. And it's uh, subject to review uh, prior to its expiration so that we can extend it for another five years. If it's appropriate, we can amend it. Uh, maybe we do take up the, the conversation about fish. Um, in addition to shellfish, that's something to be determined. So uh, my, my take home message here is mostly that um, we've got to be careful, we've got to be deliberate, words matter, and, and um, we can't rush into uh, what we think are, I, I really appreciated your comments, Catherine, about the precautionary principle, the, the insight that, that's been gained, and I think that, that shows the kind of uh, investment in, in learning and discussion and, and engagement that I think is really necessary for us to move forward in aquaculture. So thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> all right, so now... Next up, we have uh, Mark Silverstein from Elkhorn Slough Foundation, who's going to be talking to us about mariculture and conservation. Let me pull this up, Mark. There you go. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mike. <clears throat> I think we're going from the large to the provincial. I have worked for a number of years in Elkhorn Slough, which for those of you who aren't local, is right behind us here. Elkhorn Slough is a little estuary that enters Monterey Bay through Moss Landing Harbor. And again, for those of you who aren't here, this is the setting that we're in. Um, if you get lost in a submersible and want to get back to shore, uh, just follow this canyon up, and it will lead you right to Elkhorn Slough. <laughs> this is sort of an interesting setting. It may be unique. And I'm thinking in terms of what that means for looking for places you might want to cultivate uh, shellfish and seafood. But Elkhorn Slough is this little drowned river valley. <clears throat> the mouth of Elkhorn Slough is confluent with the head of this <clears throat> huge underwater canyon. So. There's a direct link between the ocean, between the deep sea, and these protected coastal waters of Elkhorn Slough. Uh, looking west from a little bit up the slough, you see some of the, the basic features that I think made this attractive to folks who early on were thinking about where they might grow food, seafood. Um, <clears throat> so we are up on this little hilltop here. Here's the main channel of Elkhorn Slough. It goes inland about seven miles. It's flanked by these broad stretches of tidal salt marsh, dominated by pickleweed, by salicornia. Um, 
you can see in this photograph a lot of the uses to which we've put these coastal embayments. A lot of the embayments up and down the coast are sort of honored with a uh, power generating stations, Humboldt Bay, and, and at one point Bodega Bay was on the, on the list, Morrow Bay. Uh, so power generation, because you can draw cooling waters from this area. Here is a, a dairy. Uh, this is farmland flanking the main channel. As you get up into the hills surrounding Elkhorn Slough, residential development, uh, more farms and things. And it always struck me that in the middle of all this fairly intensive human activity is really one of the extraordinary wildlife habitats in North America. Elkhorn Slough has been designated by the Audubon Society as a globally important bird area. It is a Western Hemisphere shorebird reserve. The tidal waters are part of the National Marine Sanctuary. The National Western Research Reserve is on the shore on the south side of the slough. It's a state marine protected area. It's a nature conservancy legacy preserve. It's kind of hard to stack it up higher than that. Um, and so this is an interesting place. And it's an interesting place to think about how we balance the needs and uses that we have and the economic uh, desires with maintaining the, the extraordinary diversity of life here. Um, I'm going to point out a couple of things that we'll come back to, but you can sort of see some of these areas in Elkhorn Slough have been diked off. Here are the ponds from the dairy. Uh, I'll show you some images here of the historic salt ponds, but this area I'll come back to. This is an area that was diked and drained. It was grazed for a while. There was a little hunt club there. Uh, and so a lot of Elkhorn Slough has been segmented historically by dikes and levees that modifies flow. Based on the archaeological record, including archaeology happening right under our feet, this was an ancient village site. We have dates going back almost 10,000 years, somewhere between some of the sites between seven and 10,000 years. We know that people lived here. They made a living here. And they enjoyed shellfish, just like we do. So these middens these excavations that the archaeologists have done are thick with the remains of all the kinds of shellfish we find in Elkhorn Slough today, including the native oyster. Um, by the time this painting was completed in the 1880s, Elkhorn Slough was already in the process of transformation. And so those early days, those halcyon days where the Ohlone uh, lived along the shore, were becoming intensified now. This is the mouth of Elkhorn Slough. There used to be a ferry across the slough. This is the Salinas River emptying down. Elkhorn Slough and the Salinas River shared a common mouth to the bay up by Jetty Road. This is Moro Coho Slough. Uh, but you can see already agriculture coming in. Here's the town of Castroville looking straight down the Salinas Valley, Fremont Peak and Toro Peak. I love this painting. This painting hangs in the rectory of the Catholic Church in Castroville. And it's about that big. And so if you ever get a chance, you don't have to genuflect when you go in. They're very <laughs> friendly and open. But it gives you this interesting historic perspective of the kinds of changes. Uh, we have records, county records, showing that the very first recorded oyster leases were right around the late 1800s, early 1900s, in this part of Elkhorn Slough, the lower Salinas River, where tidal water came in from the ocean. And so as far back as the turn of the previous century, um, there was aquaculture being initiated here. Um, you know, it's just, it's interesting. And I think, again, I have a pretty provincial perspective having worked here for a long time. But I think the kinds of changes that we've seen in Elkhorn Slough were happening up and down the coast. I mean, that this state, this country was being colonized and, and people had to make a living and create enterprises. So uh, right around the turn of the century, of the 20th century, a um, large area of Elkhorn Slough was diked and turned into salt production ponds, salt evaporating ponds. And that went on for many years. Again, you can sort of see here some of the diking. Again, this is the dairy. Here is Moss Landing Marine Labs. Uh, 
you can see an area here, a corner of the marsh was diked off and turned into a freshwater pond. So duck hunting was popular here. And so I don't know if you consider that aquaculture, but it was modifying the environment for species that depend on the aquatic environment. And so there you go. Uh, there's a great uh, publication, I think, I think Elizabeth Barrett in the 60s, it was a fish and game publication about the uh, history of oyster cultivation in California. It's really a wonderful publication. And she talks about Elkhorn Slough. And in 1930, here's what Elkhorn Slough looked like. There was quite an enterprise here of oyster cultivation. Um, and you can see, she, it's hard to see in this particular reproduction, but she lists both oyster beds and then hanging culture floats. So some of these are beds up here, all the way up towards Kirby Park, way up the slough were oyster beds in the slough. This is an aerial photograph from 1930, 1931, and it shows a lot of these features. Here are the, the uh, rafts with oysters hanging, and you can sort of see here untrammeled marshland that in the previous pictures I showed you were diked. You can see the salt ponds, you can see some tracks of levied marsh, and then marsh that has been uh, uh, free. This little area is the area that was diked and turned into a freshwater pond, a tidal marsh. So this is quite interesting. Um, the, the salt production went on for probably 50 or 60 years as a commercial salt operation. Here's some photos that uh, my colleague Andrea Woolfolk, who's quite a historian, found. Um, this is Elkhorn Slough, and we were bringing in Japanese oysters and expertise from Japan to cultivate these things in Elkhorn Slough. And here is an on-the-ground view of what it looks like from that aerial photograph I showed you earlier. Um, how they would use these seed oysters in hanging culture. Um, I love this picture because this is Albert Vieira, who owns the ranch that uh, I'll show you, Jim Harvey and I both rented a little shack on the Vieira Ranch when we were graduate students. And uh, so this was our front yard. But this is an interesting part of the history. In the, uh, this was in the 30s, sort of towards the late 30s, as animosity toward our Japanese neighbors increased and the war came on, this industry basically ended. And so, um, I think there was a, quite a hiatus. This is a, a mosaic aerial photograph from around 1980. And I show this to you because there was a, a resurgence, maybe a heyday of aquaculture and cultivation in Elkhorn Slough in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, so this is kind of an interesting perspective. It's also for younger folks, a perspective of how we used to put maps and photos together before Google Earth. Now, now, this is pretty easy. As an aside, we have loaded our complete archive of geo-referenced historic aerial photos in Google Earth. So you use that little time slider. You, too, can go back to 1931 and see what things looked like. But in this image, in this larger image of the lower part of the slough, here are hanging oyster racks from international shellfish. I understand there was someone here yesterday from International Shellfish who worked there. Okay, so you guys can correct me on some of this stuff, but that was an extraordinary enterprise. There was a hatchery uh, down the island that's now, the building is now owned by Moss Landing Marine Labs, um, but it was a, a huge enterprise. A lot of our graduate student cohorts worked there. Um, but so you can correct me if you're, I'm wrong, but these were some of the, the floating racks. Salt ponds were no longer producing salt, but there was a brine shrimp operation going on. So people were harvesting brine shrimp for aquarium trade and eggs. Um, down to five? Okay. I will, I'll talk fast. Yeah. Here's one of the old duck ponds. And now here's an enterprise I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, this was built in the probably late 70s as a trout farm. This was a Garapata trout farm. Anybody from Garapata trout farm here? Um, the idea was to raise steelhead here. 
So they were acclimated to the ocean. They would go out and swim back into the packages that you could send to the market. Um, and so this was excavated into the marsh. This is on the Vieira Ranch. Um, I think here's the cabin that Jim and I lived in. Um, so this was quite an interesting enterprise. They raised trout for some time. When that ended, it was an enterprise raising gracilaria. So Judy Hansen from uh, Sea Grant was raising red algae there and looking at carrageenan in production. And when that ended, I will share with you one of, the, one of the things that happened then. Another enterprise here, American Shellfish, was a small operation Chet Belknap <clears throat> ran, and he was growing uh, spat that he would sell, clams and oysters. Um, so this was really quite an active agricultural hotspot in the 80s. Now here's a little close up. Here are these racks, the salt ponds. Here's the trout farm, an old duck pond. This is the discharge, warm water discharge from the PG&E plant. Uh, here's the legendary Harvey Silberstein cabin. Um, what happened in the cabin stays in the cabin. Is that right, Jim? Yes. OK. Um, so these enterprises evolved and changed. And when salt was no longer valuable and no longer, uh, it was no longer productive, they went to brine shrimp. <clears throat> On the trout farm, when trout were no longer productive and economically viable, it went to red algae. When red algae was no longer viable, it went to sea slugs. And so this became that little area that I showed you became a slug ranch. And one of the things that helped pay for my graduate education was slopping the slugs on the slug ranch. So I worked for Mike Morris and Sea Life Supply. And we raised California sea hares. This is Kerstin Wasson with a, maybe like a six pounder. You know, these animals get up to be 25 pounds. <coughs> but we would raise them up to about uh, you know, 120 grams or so, sell them in New York. We would ship them to New York where we got about 10 to $15 a piece for these slugs. Um, you can't eat them, they're, they're distasteful, they're slimy. However, they have nerve cells that are this big. They have nerve cells that are a millimeter across. Eric Kandel at Columbia University used these to understand how impulses transmitted across synapses. <laughs> so he went through a lot of slugs, and we were happy to provide them. And I have limited time, but I will tell you this little wrinkle of the story. Um, they were, they figured out, one of my colleagues worked for Eric Kandel, he was able to complete the life cycle from the eggs. He could get the eggs, he could get these animals to settle, he could get them up to this big. <coughs> but they were California sea slugs. They required algae from California. So Mike Morris, every year would ship, every, every week, would ship to JFK Airport boxes of California algae that Tom Capo would use to feed these slugs on the 19th floor of the Columbia Medical Center in New York City. I visited the place. We figured out it's going to be cheaper to send these little slugs to California. It was sort of proprietary how he got this thing done. He sent us little slugs this big. We raised them in Elkhorn Slough to this big, flew them back to New York, where they became part of this Nobel Prize winning enterprise. You never know. But this was a serious mariculture operation in Elkhorn Slough. Um, this is, you can see Chet Belknap's place. These are the racks for the oysters. Oh, I like that tune. Um, this is a fairly recent picture. So that trout farm, the levees broke. This is now being flooded. Uh, the salt ponds no longer raise brine shrimp. This is now habitat. This is owned by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for snowy plovers. And so this is now a critical nesting place for snowy plovers, dry most of the year. But you sort of get this sense, kind of this progression of activity. In the early days, when oysters were being cultivated here, uh, bat rays were a problem. They liked to eat these shellfish. Uh, the Pajaro Valley Rod and Gun Club started a shark derby in Elkhorn Slough to get rid of these animals that were impacting the oyster industry. Uh, and so 
the Rod and Gun Club had this shark derby for decades. Moss Landing Marine Lab students came in and they would just bring a uh, dumpster at the end of the derby. People would throw these huge animals, a lot of pregnant females, into the dumpster. Moss Landing Marine Lab students said, let's do something else and started a tagging program. So they would tag and release animals and got data from it. Otters were not part of the equation back then, but this may be something you have to consider as you think about raising shellfish in places like Elkhorn Slough. I'm gonna end with this. <coughs> the frame is always shifting. And so you, I showed you images of the areas that were diked and drained and used for different purposes in Elkhorn Slough. Uh, this is an area that had been diked, drained, and sunk, and the marshes drowned, is now being refilled using recycled sediment from the Pajaro River. This is now one of the largest uh, uh, sediment addition projects ever in the history of Elkhorn Slough. 61 acres of marshland are coming back. On Wednesday, the levee was breached, and the tide for the first time <coughs> creeped in. Um, two of my cohorts here, I know Ross is going to talk about some of the inputs to Elkhorn Slough and what we can do, and Brent is going to talk about some of the positive things with oysters. You know, I, I thought I would have to end with this poem. Nobody loses all the time. This is E.E. E. Cummings. Nobody loses all the time. I had an uncle named Saul who was a born failure, and nearly everybody said he should have gone into vaudeville, perhaps because my uncle Saul could sing McCann, he was a diver on Christmas Eve like hell itself, which may or may not account for the fact that my uncle, Saul, indulged in that possibly most inexcusable of all, to use a highfalutin phrase, luxuries, that is or to it farming. And be it needlessly added, my uncle Saul's farm failed because the chickens ate the vegetables. So my uncle Saul had a chicken farm until the skunks ate the chickens when my uncle Saul had a skunk farm, but the skunks caught cold and died, and so my uncle imitated the skunks in a subtle manner, or by drowning himself in the water tank, but somebody who'd given my uncle Saul a Victor Victrola and records while he lived, presented to him upon his auspicious occasion of his decease, a scrumptious, not to mention splendiferous fun funeral, with tall boys in black gloves and flowers and everything, and I remember we all cried like the Missouri when my uncle Saul's coffin lurched because somebody pressed a button and down went Uncle Saul and started a worm farm. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that was great. Um, and, and I think, I, I forget who it was, I think it was yesterday when it was either Kenny or Alan was telling you stories, and they were saying stories resonate. And I think for us, at least the rest of the day, as you hear for the morning what's going on in Elkhorn Slough, I think, Mark, I think your stories are going to resonate. Um, and everyone's going to want to have a tour of the cabin. It's still <laughs> functional. Um, we're going to take a little break. Uh, the speakers are, are here. They're going to be hanging out. We've still got some pastries and coffee available. So we're going to take about 10 minutes. And then when we come back, you're going to hear from two of the only three farms currently active in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and then we're going to hear from an exciting new set of projects going on uh, for the rest of the morning. All right. So about, we'll start calling you in about 10 minutes. So Mark, can I come tell you, talk about snails soon?
So Luke. Okay, so so if, if I have notes, they'll come up in here. I think so. I don't know. Why don't we go to the next? Oh, there they are. Is that yeah, good these enough? Are the, these are the notes here. Yeah. yeah. And if I need to scroll down, can I? Do you know how to put it back to that like, situation where you can see like the upcoming slides? All right. Welcome back. So now we're going to start. We're going to have two presentations um, for two of the farms that are currently operating within the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And then after that, we're going to roll right into a series of talks uh, related to some specifics projects that are going on. And so first, I want to, uh, I get the opportunity to introduce my friend, Art Seavey, who um, with Trevor Fay. Trevor's here somewhere as well in the back, run Monterey Bay Abalone, or Monterey Abalone Company, which is down on the wharf. If you haven't been there, uh, these guys couldn't be more open-doored for letting excited and enthusiastic people come down. It is probably the most 
I, I used to call it the most Steinbeckian experience in Monterey, but it's really the most Rickettsian, which is a bad word to use. With <laughs> but it's the most Rickettsian experience because when you go under the wharf and see what they're doing there, it's just a, it, it brings you back to all the reasons why you want to do what you're doing. Um, so it's pretty cool. So it's my pleasure to bring um, Art CV up to introduce us to the Monterey Abalone Company. Mike, uh, thank, thank you and Luke and everyone else uh, responsible for, for allowing us to present here. Uh, I want to acknowledge Trevor uh, as my partner and with whom I wouldn't be here either. Uh, so uh, Monterey Abalone Company is, uh, we're a small uh, wharf, I'm a small abalone farm under the wharf. Uh, I always like to start, start with this slide uh, because uh, <coughs> Where does the word abalone come from? Sometimes people ask us that. And uh, it uh, comes from the Spanish word abulon, which is from the Rumsen language. Uh, and uh, the Rumsen Indians actually lived here in this, uh, the Rumsen pe people, I should say, uh, from uh, about Watsonville down to Point Sur and, and Carmel River Basin and uh, around Salinas as well. So we're located under that building in the background there, uh, we have a shop, a little shop in the front, and we have a trap door and a ladder, and you climb down under the wharf, and we built a bunch of walkways, and we suspend cages uh, right there in the water. Uh, and uh, we've been farming there since almost 30 years now. Uh, I started there in 94, and uh, the business was founded by a guy named Joe Cavanaugh, who was tasked by the county of Monterey to look for ways to expand their agricultural base. And, so he was actually involved in an incipient uh, bag lettuce uh, uh, adventure, and uh, we know where, where that led. Uh, and he was also very excited about aquaculture, and, and he started this business, and, uh, and we carried, the, carried the, the torch, so to speak. Um, so this is a great slide that was uh, made by a, <coughs> a journalist uh, for the San Jose Mercury News, and it kind of summarizes our operation very well. Uh, we used to buy see our seed abalone. We now have a hatchery uh, located here on, on, uh, in Moss Landing, and I'll get to that more of that in a minute. But uh, so we bought our seed at about 30 millimeters in size, and grew them up uh, to the smallest size, about three and a half inches. That we grew them, to, that we grow them to uh, about a quarter pound each. It took about three years. Uh, we have. Uh, cages suspended underneath the walkways, uh, panels inside for the abalones to crawl around on. Uh, every week we pull up every cage, uh, open them up, check for predators, uh, hose them out with seawater, and stuff them full of kelp and put them back on, uh, under, the, under the wharf. Uh, it's, it's a lot of labor. And we have great guys under the wharf uh, feeding day in and day out. Uh, it's, uh, and, and it's one of the most uh, important skills for our operation, how much kelp you put in there. You put in too much kelp, the sea water can't flow through, the abalone will, will suffocate. You don't put enough in, they're not gonna grow as fast as they could. So it's a, it's, it's a fun, fun job. For, and this is kind of a seasick picture here of, that shows our cage, cages swaying under the wharf. Gives you an idea. Uh, here's Trevor pulling a cage up out of the water uh, getting ready to feed it, uh, <clears throat> you can see uh, that it's not a very uh, ample ceiling space there under the wharf, and uh, <laughs> for me that's a problem. Uh, uh, and as as uh, as the sea level rises, uh, it's a you know it's not a problem I'm going to have to worry about, uh, hopefully, but uh, our, our our successors may. So here's an, a cage, uh, an abalone cage. You can see the panels and the abalone hanging out on the side of it. Uh, this is what it looks like as, as it's one's being fed. Uh, gives you an idea of, of the amount of kelp we go through. Kelp is a, kelp is a, great, uh, a great plant to work with. We love kelp. Um, we love harvesting it. That's the, the funnest part of the job, going out on the skiff and, and being out on the water. Um, it's a great plant because it grows very quickly it's a, it's a perennial plant rooted to the bottom that grows very fast in certain seasons and uh, is suited to being harvested because in 
in the winter time, it's basically washed away by the swells and has to regrow. Uh, so it captures a lot of nutrients, and uh, as we all know, uh, that's the great thing about shellfish culture, whether it's kelp or phytoplankton, nutrients are being absorbed by the plants and, uh, and then are, they're removed from the water when you harvest your, your product. Uh, here's one of our guys harvesting from a paddy of uh, drift kelp in, in the wintertime. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's, it's hard work. Uh, we, and when our farm is full of abalone, we go through about five wet tons of kelp a week. Um, it's a lot of kelp, and it's, uh, there was a study conducted by the sanctuary uh, back in the 90s um, when there was a dispute about harvesting kelp, uh, which was a, we called affectionately the kelp wars. <laughs> and uh, uh, luckily, the sanctuary was the adult in the room, and we were very grateful for them. They commissioned a study to determine how much kelp is, pr is produced by our local kelp beds. Uh, Mike Foster, uh, did that and did that work, and uh, he figured there were about 100,000 tons produced uh, by our local kelp beds every year, which, of course, in the winter swells, almost all of it was washed up on the beaches and then regrown. So if, if we were using five tons a week, that's 260 tons of kelp a year, about a quarter of 1% of that biomass uh, that's going into our farm. Uh, so here's another. Uh, picture of our favorite animal and uh, <laughs> they're, they're you know they're quite beautiful uh, we, we're really proud of our product we're proud of how we produce it and we're proud of, of how we our business has changed over the years and the support that we've get we've gotten from the community especially here at uh, Moss Lane Marine Labs we've even been involved in several projects with Mike and with with other people uh, we've hired students here to manage our farm, to work on our farm. We've had many interns, and uh, we, we, we're very grateful. Uh, another picture uh, here you can see a nice, that sort of brownish fringe of, of, of new growth on the shell. That's a very, we're happy when we see that. Our abalones are, are healthy and growing fast. Um, it's a good sign. So one of the projects that we've collaborated with Mosslanding Marine Labs on is our hatchery. Uh, we're an industrial partner in the Center for Aquaculture. We have a small hatchery and a nursery. Um, these are, uh, and it's run by uh, Peter Hain, uh, who's also here in the audience, and uh, he's produced six crops for us, each one better than the, better than the last, uh, bigger, healthier, a more, um, better survival, so we're very grateful for Peter's fine work. And, uh, these are guys, the biggest abalone you see here are about 10 millimeters, maybe. Um, they're, they're just, <laughs> they're very cute. Just transitioning from, uh, from a diet of uh, 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 diatom film, from eating diatom and uh, uh, bacterial films to macroalgae. And this is an important, very important transition. Uh, one thing we've learned is that the faster they transition onto macroalgae, the faster we can get them eating kelp, uh, the more success we're gonna have with them in the farm, the healthier they're gonna be, the faster they're gonna grow. Um, so that's, a, that's been a, a, a learning uh, step for us. Uh, this is Dolphs that we, we've, we have a few tanks uh, that pale in comparison to Mike, Mike's tanks, which you're gonna see uh, soon. And uh, there's a benefit of shellfish farm. This is, uh, from a publication in 2002. Every kilogram removes 16.8. You can mitigate your own my nitrogen excretion <laughs> by eating shellfish. So you gotta eat a lot of it. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, you know, anyway, it's, it's, that, that's another reason why we like shellfish, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it has an, envir an, an environmental, an uh, ecological service. <laughs> it's about 15 oysters a day. It's not that bad. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's a less painless, that's even a more painless way of, of doing it. So, uh, what's next for Monterey Abalone Company? Our, our dream is to, to have a seaweed farm, and, and we've been working for 
20 years on growing rock scallops. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, I, back in the, in the mid 90s, I saw a little spat adhering to some of our uh, abalone culture gear. And I said, wow, look at this. Uh, what can we do with these? And we started playing with them. Oh, these rock scallops, they cement onto any, any kind of surface. You'll never be able to grow them. Well, we, we figured out that by holding them at high densities, that they wouldn't, you know, they were sort of like, we, I can't cement here because there's too many scallops around. So they just keep getting, kept getting bigger and then reached the, the point where they could no longer cement. And so we figured out we could grow them sort of on the, you know, as singles, to use an oyster growing term. And uh, so anyway, we are hopeful that someday we will have a farm where we can grow our own seaweed and, 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 uh, and, and grow these scallops alongside of it. Uh, and, and there's a confluence of events right now that really make it uh, more important for us than ever to, to have a, a, a consistent su supply of seaweed. This, uh, this purple urchin explosion that we've been seeing here, as, uh, there's a local science, uh, citizen scientist uh, group called Reef Check that has documented in their 16 uh, transects around the Monterey Peninsula, have documented, I think, greater than a 90% reduction in, in, the, in the kelp forests around the Monterey Peninsula. And uh, we all know that these uh, urchin barrens can persist for decades. They, they've been shown to persist for 60 to 80 years in, in, in Australia. Can, you, can we imagine not having kelp forests in Monterey for the next 60 to 80 years? That's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a daunting thing, but especially for us because we, we need kelp to feed our, our animals. So that's, 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 you know, besides wanting to save my skull from getting more scarred underneath the wharf, <laughs> we'd like to get out and farm some kelp uh, and farm, farm some other seaweed so that we can vary the, the diet of the abalone. Um, maybe we can sell some seaweed to some chefs. Maybe we can grow some scallops and uh, have another great product to add to uh, the local supply. And uh, you know we are on the commercial wharf. We get a lot of intrepid tourists who uh, come down the wharf, and uh, and it's 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 a value. I think people want to eat locally sourced seafood. People, they're, they're, we need uh, interesting things for people to talk about. And, and it goes back to your point, Catherine. On, you know what 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 can we do here that's that's going to be exciting and and sustainable. So that's that's hopefully the future. There's one of our scallops, uh, it's a big one, and uh, they're amazing. But thank you very much. So since I'm up next, I'm going to put my talk. We have definitely have time for a question for Art. Have, have you looked into that Mitsubishi food with fat and uh, sea urchins? No, we haven't. Yeah, because that, that looks like it'd be a very lucrative thing to get into because First of all, you can get those uh, kelp predators out of the water and turn them into uh, sushi. <laughs> I just read an article a couple of days ago. That it's a dish you can find. We have a Norwegian company. She's raising her hand back there. So a little bit later, Mike, we can hear about the, the Mitsubishi seafoods. And Art's going to take his stab at 5,600 oysters at lunch. Um, so <laughs> definitely come find him and Trevor uh, and Peter if you guys have any questions. So thanks again, Art. So I get to introduce myself. I'm going to introduce probably many of you to something you might not have known that's actually in existence in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, I wear kind of three hats here, and so today you're going to hear about my third one. A little bit later, you're going to hear about the first one. So I'm a professor here at the Marine Lab, um, director of advancement for the Center for Aquaculture, but also the founder, owner, president, IT, human resources, the whole shebang for Monterey Bay Seaweeds. Sorry. Um, oh, thanks. Or, which, is, uh, which is a land-based seaweed farm here that I, I want to talk to you guys about um, in a second. So uh, we're going to just... Go forward. You, you've seen this graph. Like, it should be burned into your head after the last day. Um, and so the question, you know, for me has always been is, you know, why are we talking about aquaculture? Um, and we're obviously talking about that big green explosion that's going on. But I think, you know, you didn't hear about this yesterday, and I think it's lost on a lot of people that uh, much of that explosion comes from seaweed globally. 
So, this, so you take that big explosion, which is this upper graph up here, and the seaweed's in white, and the non-seaweed's the rest of the colors. Finfish is the blue. And that comes from the big three, basically, which is carrageenan fun and agar, you know, basically hydrocolloids that are come from red algae, often grown in the tropics, but other, other temperate regions as well. And then you've got nori, which we had last night, right? Seaweed wraps, and you know, you get buffalo flavored now at Costco, if you want. And, um, and then kombu and wakame, which are the, the, the processed blanched kelp or dried kelp that gets sent over for either miso soups or for thickening things, uh, uh, other uh, food products, um, creating dashis, et cetera. That's where the bulk of the, of the seaweed around the planet is. So when you talk about seaweed farming, that's where, where we're at, right? Um, and these are what those farms look like. Okay, and I, you know, this is just playing around on Google and finding seaweed farming, right? You, you get a lot of cr interesting pictures. And, um, but these are pretty extensive scales, right? And these are only some, I mean, Norway, Chile, there's a lot of countries that are doing this at a, at a large scale. But, but Japan, Korea, China, um, they're the big ones, okay? And, uh, and I'm a seaweed biologist, so this is where I live. Right, I, that picture and that picture aren't compatible. And so I'm sitting here in California thinking I'm a seaweed biologist at Moss Landing Marine Labs in the middle of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and all the kids that come to me, my grad students that come from local schools, they didn't actually grow up, they, they might have grown up seeing this, but what they really grew up seeing was this. Right, and, and you know, I didn't get the otter Oz or the little baby abalone Oz, <laughs> but but this is clearly the most charismatic alga on the planet. And you notice when you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the logo is not an otter head; it's a kelp scimitar, the growing tip of a kelp. Right, and and you know, hey, you're you're hearing it from me. Um, and this is this is how I was raised academically, and this is my view of, of what California is. Um, as long as the urchins are, are behaving and, and pollution's not too heavy and sedimentation's not too strong and El Nino is in the opposite phase and the PDO is swinging down and all the things that go on, this is what California looks like, right? So, but I'm still telling you about aquaculture. I'm telling you about a seaweed farm. And, and it's hard to reconcile all this, right? Here's my view. And then for me, for aquaculture, I'm thinking, okay, it's gotta be environmentally responsible, socially responsible, and economically sustainable. So it has to be a nexus of all three of these. And we've talked about this a bit. And then, and so somewhere in there, this understanding of how systems work and the biology has to equate to money, right? Because there's so much we can do altruistically and get subsidies from NGOs and the government, but unless a farm makes money, you're not gonna continue doing it, right? And for someone like me who has a, a large commitment to college education in my own family, um, <laughs> We really do have to make money doing this, you know, and, and none of the producers here, 30 years, this, mine's a three-year project, you know, you hear from Art and you hear from John and Terry on how long they've been looking at it, it's, a, it's an enormous commitment. So how do you do this? Well, you, you take those values and you embed it deeply in what you do, and then you find really cool friends, and there, there's Art and Trevor, smiling nice and happy, and, you know, I, I was a, I'm a kelp horse ecologist, I go under water, dealing with what's going on on the planet, wasn't really doing aquaculture until I met these guys, all right? And they had a need that I, I, I had potentially some skills that could help them with, and that was they were trying to grow some seaweed. I mean, Art told you a little bit about why they needed seaweed, um, but we got into this project where we were growing seaweed for them. We're growing red algae, we weren't growing them out in federal waters, we weren't growing them in state waters, we're growing them in harbor waters, right? Harbor district waters. And we heard yesterday how important those ports might be with the nascent little clusters and centers for getting this going. Monterey Harbor was no different. And so we started this little teeny farm. There's about four floats right here. Here's the app farm. This is a seaweed farm. And we grew Gracilaria. And in this case, it's Gracilaria opsis andersoni, native species found right underneath the farm, hanging it up. That piece right there, that's my student few. That was a five centimeter piece. Um, growth rates are about 11% a day. So it's basically doubling every week. You take a couple trimmings, you cut them off, you hang it up on the clothesline, it grows, there's no seeding necessary. Um, in fact, if you seed it, it grows even slower. It was funded by, by Sea Grant, super cool, right? Um, and plus, they would give me a few abalone every once in a while to prime my family. And as I'm doing this, my family's starting to think, aquaculture, cool. 
my wife, who you might be seeing floating around here, has this culinary brain and says, you know what, you're, you're learning something here that I think we could, we could tweak um, and do something special. And so the idea was, is together we as a family came up with Monterey Bay Seaweeds. We actually came up with a colleague of ours, you're going to hear a little bit later, our partner Ross Clark, with sustainable sea culture technologies. And there were two missions here. One was to create a project uh, that would be basically bioremediation of fertilizers and polluted estuaries. We're going to hear a little bit about that later. The flip side of it was the sustainable production of raw, fresh, and alive seaweed for premium markets, right? Not the big three, not the second largest volume of aquaculture product on the planet. That's being done by people with a lot more money, a lot more area, and an enormous amount of concrete and buoys and ropes and everything else going on. That doesn't fit, right? This is a niche component. And so we are the first public-private partnership here at Moss Marine Labs and San Jose State University. So the university has an equity share in our company. Um, we're right on site. We're unable to take you guys down there any time during this week, but later on in October, if you're up here, we can, we can bring you out um, to the farm, and, and you can see Monterey Bay Seaweeds. We are entirely land-based, and our mission was simple. We, want, we, me, and my family, and my colleagues here at Moss Landing, um, this isn't a massive corporation meant to make an enormous amount of money. We wanted to demonstrate the utility of sustainable seaweed farming, simply the utility of doing it sustainably. Right? We wanted to increase public awareness of the fact that these are nutritious. I'm not a chef, but I eat seaweed. Um, I at least am able to do a scientific analysis on the nutritional quality of the seaweed and pass that on to somebody who can turn that into, that makes for a great food. We, can we wanted to encourage the creative use of fresh. We never process our seaweed. Our chefs, when they get our seaweed, comment always that this is what it tasted like when you, meaning me, took them to the inner tidal and we tasted it off the rock. Chefs don't get that with kombu, they don't get that with wakame, they don't get that with nori, and they definitely don't get that with karagine, right? And that was the idea here, is to, is to focus on that aspect. And then we wanted to demonstrate that a, a large family um, in California could do this. Um, and again, we talked a bit more about that with scale. And I know we were talking earlier about how we could start, for example, in, in shellfish farming at the smaller scale, as opposed to necessarily going after the larger farms that might be a little bit harder to, to force through the gauntlet here in California, right? And so, there's my, my son, our first employee. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so what do we do? We do land-based tank culture system. We're on site, Moss Island Marine Labs, um, d down at the Center for Aquaculture. We use tumble culture of vegetative farms. My expertise is life histories. I know how to get these things to propagate uh, sexually. It's a pain in the ass. So go for the ones that are vegetative and, and easier to propagate. It's just like rice. You take a little bit for, for starting the next crop and the rest of it you keep for yourself. Minimal harvesting of the seed stock. Every once in a while we've gotta go out and we have to go collect some from the field um, and, bring, and bring it in to propagate these, these species. Um, but the hope is, is to ultimately have all these completely closed so that we're using uh, Ogo that apparently was first propagated in 1998 and we haven't had to go back to the field since. Um, completely chemical free. Uh, our sanctuary has done a great job. Our water is clean and our water actually comes from just at the mouth of the canyon um, below the euphotic zone. And so there's no need to add uh, nutrients and there's no need, we don't, we don't use any chemicals, any epiphytes or anything gets on our seaweed. Um, our grad students, uh, employees pick them out by hand. Um, because, because if you're going to say you're making a sustainable product, and if you're going to argue that this is what Californians want, is the freshest, um, uh, least modified uh, product as possible, then you have to do that, right? We only work with native California species, period. Um, and we target species that cannot be sustainably foraged or farmed offshore. So if you can go out and pick kelp, we're not gonna farm it, why not go out and sustainably forage it? That would be a, a useless thing for me to farm in this high intensity farming system. If you could farm it offshore, like sugar kelp, um, which we only have really to the north, or macrocystis, or some other species that are looking to be developed within California, effectively in a large, large offshore farm, then we don't want any of that as well. Because at one point, someone's gonna be able to figure out how to do that, and there's no need to do this, okay? And then finally, by doing land-based systems, we minimize water use and energy usage. Okay. So our, this is a, just a background shot of part of our farm. The other part's off to the right. It's a series of experimental tanks. 
uh, medium scale, those large white tanks in the back are, are commercial scale. I'm going to show you another picture in a sec. It simply tumbles around using aeration um, and the water that comes in from Monterey Bay, natural sunlight, and, uh, and again, a lot of manicuring as you go through it. Uh, we, uh, again, we do not process at all. So when we ship, when we deliver locally, it's in seawater. When we ship uh, within 24 hours, it arrives to the restaurant in seawater because you can actually afford to do so. Again, calling it local. The best thing to be local if you're going to be doing this is anywhere that UPS uh, ground is actually next day. So I can ship UPS ground from here to San Francisco. It arrives the same time as next day at about a tenth of the cost. So now I can effectively ship seawater. A chef opens a bag, pops it open, and smells like the, when they went surfing this morning. Right, and that's what they want to have because then they're able to bring that to their customers. And this is something we just came out recently. If any of you get California Bounty or Bountiful um, magazine, this is one of our chefs. This is uh, Chef Pablo at Roy's, right, which is out at Spanish Bay. Um, he's our, our number one uh, customer for Ogo. He used to buy from Hawaii. It would arrive slightly wilted because it has to come from Hawaii. Paid enormous amount. Um, for the shipping, and here he's able to use local California Ogo, tweaked all of his, um, his recipes. You can actually see the Ogo right here on both the roll. He's got watermelon dishes that have it. It goes into the drinks. Um, but again, the idea is it's local. They like the local story. They like the fact that they look out in Spanish Bay. They tell the story all the time about the bay, and now they have a product um, as well as when they're able to get the abalone in um, and the oysters and say this is done locally here. But it's a creative chef that's able to utilize and wants that raw material. They don't want it blanched because there's only so much they can do it. They don't want it dry because reconstitute seaweed does not taste the same. They want to be able to pickle it. You guys had yesterday our seaweed out from the aquarium guys and the pokey. Um, and the, one was pickled and one was obviously in the pokey and then one was raw. You can't do that if we process it. And so if you're going to focus on these high-end markets, you really have to do as little as possible, but have as high quality possible. So those are the five species we do. This is actually my last, no, my second to last slide. Um, those are the five species we do. On the left here, we have dulse, right, which has gotten a decent amount of fame on the East Coast, very sustainably harvested on the East Coast, not in California. It's hard to find dulse populations that are large enough to do any foraging. This is leaf nori. We don't do dried nori, we do fresh leaf nori. You, you don't get that because we get, you know, you, again, you can forage it. But it's, uh, it's very seasonal, as is our sea lettuce, which you had a little bit of yesterday. Um, the ogo, which is on the far right, which is probably the flagship species in both Southern and, cent and Central California, the best species to propagate. It's been done for quite a bit of time. Uh, Carlsbad Aqua Farms have been doing it. California Sea Grant's got a great white paper on how to do ogo. Um, and then the, what you had yesterday on the sushi, you, yesterday was the, the sea grape. It grows about as fast as redwoods. Um, so <laughs> you, you're not selling you know, 100,000 wet tons of sea grapes unless you've got probably a farm the size of Nebraska and have a long time to wait. Um, but it's a great item that, that really broadens the diversity of people to be able to use it. So that's our farm. You know, I, many of you haven't known about it. It was probably a, a first time for some of you. Um, we've been here for three years. It's actually three years next week. Um, so we're, we're new to the game. Um, we're having a great time doing this. As some of you know, I'm happy to talk about this whenever you want. Um, as is my wife and my children and, and, and the director and everyone else who's around here. It's, it's a really nice story. And it kind of gets you to think something like, like this. This is from our friend John Guido at Seasteading. He's got a great book on this if you guys can look at it. This is, you, you, start, you start thinking after all the stuff going on, and I don't know if this is even possible. I mean, that kind of looks like R2-D2 up there in the top <laughs> corner. Um, and, and it gets scary when you think of this because they do this in China, not like this, right? It just looks like a bunch of rats in a hut, and you realize, oh my gosh, there's a family living on there. Um, this is different. This is more of the, the integrated fashion. This is, you know, you hear about programs like Green Wave and Ocean Approved and how we're integrating, you know, components on, on the East Coast, and you can imagine this, you know, hanging out somewhere in our future, you know, a much more holistic, utopian situation where, uh, where the nutrients are sucking up, or the seaweed sucking up your nutrients, and, and the, the oysters are sucking up everything else, and, and you've got some fin fish feeding right there. So I'm just leaving you this with you, not because this is what I want, but because I, I want you to think California. I want you to think our values, and I want you to stop thinking about massive nori farms on, on the coast of China, and I want you to stop thinking 
about huge um, uh, kombu farms you know, off of Japan when you think of this perspective and when you look out here. Because th there is at one point where you take the precautionary principle, as you say, and you back off of it to allow entrepreneurs the opportunity. But you don't back off that much. Because you know, we're going to be gone at one point, and then everyone else is going to, all, all my kids are going to have to deal with what we did. And I think it needs to stay within the value system. So that's what I wanted to leave you with for Monterey Bay Seaweeds. And now we're going to, so that's all I have. And I absolutely have no time for questions. Um, but I would like to bring up our next speaker, who we heard from yesterday, um, Tony Vaught for the California Aquaculture Association, because now we're going to transition. And we've told you two farms. There's this third farm is another abalone farm up in Davenport that are currently operating in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary under existing regulations, right? And now we're going to hear a little about some opportunities that might be able to, ha to, uh, to occur in this region, not offshore and not necessarily near shore, but potentially utilizing some, some unique, uh, a unique situation. And that is this integration on land between aquaculture and agriculture. And this is not new in California, so Tony Vaught's going to introduce us to kind of the history or, or some examples of how this has been done statewide. So again, Tony Vaught with lessons learned from integrating aquaculture and agriculture. Thank you, Mike. Yep, that is there if you want it. Okay, great. Well, it's good to see you all again today and uh, it's a more casual group today and I think that's a good thing since it's a Saturday. Um, I was going to dress down and wear my chest waders, but they get a little warm when you're not in the water, so uh, <laughs> decided to dress appropriately. So, so uh, you know, I think uh, Luke and Michael maybe invited me here to drag everybody on shore once in a while. <laughs> and uh, and what, my, what I like, the message today is what we've done over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years in uh, uh, aquaculture in California, integrating what we do uh, with our neighbors and with other parts of agriculture in California. So I'll let you use your imagination on what maybe can happen with salt water, but uh, pretty obvious that there are salt water crops that are not fish and that are not shellfish that can be raised in some kind of a cooperative fashion. And also there's a lot of opportunity to you know, provide the water that's needed for wetlands and for other sanctuaries that maybe don't have a consistent source of water that can, that can, that can really uh, make a big dent in preserving what's going on there. I, know, I mean, we, uh, we, water is, is the key to, to everything that we're doing and talking about here today, whether it be salt, brackish, or, or fresh water. And so, so uh, I'll move through this and, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get started. Uh, this is a rice farm in uh, Northern California. It's a little, uh, it was from a crop duster, so that's why the angle. <laughs> and so, so th they don't really fly straight very much, <laughs> except when they're, where they're doing their thing. And then the other one there is just a little depiction of, of really na being a good neighbor is what it's all about. It doesn't matter where you are. You know. I got the right one here. The up button, is it working, Michael? Right, right, right. Oh, right there. Yeah, got it. Okay. Okay, so uh, why resource partnerships? And that's what we're talking about here in a lot of cases is, is we share what we, uh, the resources we have, whether, whatever it might be. This is just one example, the, you know, the drought in California. Uh, we've had to be careful about our water use and what we use it for. Everybody's watching you. How many gallons of water does it take to grow one almond? How much does it uh, cost to grow a, a plate full of rice? All of that's going on. And so, so aquaculture has an advantage there. We, we, we borrow the water most of the time and we just, uh, you know, use it uh, we, we just utilize it to grow our product and then we pass it along for somebody else to use and hopefully in a, in a uh, productive manner. So, so really aquaculture doesn't use water, it just borrows water. So in that case, we're in pretty good shape. Um, I'm going to show you some farms today and they seem big based on what Michael just said, you know, and they might look kind of like 
the bad word industrial farms, but they're all family farms and they all are fit in the same type of thing. Most of the farms in California are family farms and most of them um, you know, have started that way and, and like Michael is doing, he's uh, finding a way to put all of his kids to work. So, so anyway, they, they, it works out well. And the same model goes for, has gone on in agriculture for years, whether it be a dairy, whether it be the rice farmers, whether it's the model for agriculture. And some of the farms, yeah, do get picked up by larger companies, but certainly for the most part, they stay a family and they grow. The family grows, the farm grows, and hopefully everybody gets along. So let me, let me back up here. Um, this farm here is uh, one that is um, in uh, uh, central California. You can see that the, the ponds there are used for warm water fish culture, whether it be catfish, hybrid carp, whether it be largemouth bass, all the freshwater fish I talked about yesterday. And also um, uh, the, uh, uh, and the water is used for irrigating almonds in this case. So they grow very well and uh, so there's no need to uh, pump any more water uh, than, goes, than what goes to the fish farm, and so it's utilized in a very good way. Cost sharing, of course, uh, in this case, the farm on the right-hand side that grows everything from sturgeon, a ca uh, it's caviar farm, it's largemouth bass, it's, it's catfish, it's carp, it's integrated very well to use all the water well through its farm. In other words, first use water for one crop, second and third use water on the farm for fish, and then uh, uh, the other part of the farms in the central part of the, uh, let's see if I can get the pointer work. Oops, this is working today, huh? <laughs> okay, the central part here is where uh, another part of the farm is. Here's a water ski lake over here. And this farmer actually funded the irrigation system. This goes on. For, for miles around here for all of this agriculture to share the water. In other words, he wanted to make sure his water was utilized in a responsible way, so he uh, built the delivery fit system for all of these farms that grow grapes and they grow alfalfa and they grow um, uh, lots of different products uh, that we eat today. So, Environmental responsibility, this is the Humboldt uh, Bay uh, uh, project and they cleaned up a site that was a pulp mill and they put an oyster uh, seed. You heard a little bit about the oyster seed operation that's on this site and they recently drilled a couple of saltwater wells, tested it for on-site fin fish culture and so they're moving forward to have this as a site. And, and so what have they done? They've, uh, they've uh, made this into something that can produce clean food and they got rid of a problem that, uh, that, that the pulp mill had, had created over the years, and, uh, and, and I think that's a really good, responsible thing to do. Uh, consumer awareness, we've been talking about that a lot today, too. Uh, if somebody's eating in a restaurant, they want to know, they want to follow the pathway back to where that product came from, and so we need to tell a good story um, and tell it accurately and tell it honestly about what we're doing. And so if you don't create uh, the situation where you can, you can tell that story, then you have no story. So, so being responsible with our resources, our water, our land, all the things that we do on the, on, on, while we're growing our crops is really the basis of the story um, in, a, in addition to uh, environmentally uh, Response, environmental responsibility and wetlands. Diversification. This is an interesting project here. Back in the 1960s, to the left there, the soil was taken out of this big borrow pit on the left, and it was moved to build the highway that, that, that's on the right over here, the highway um, in Northern California. And so there was a gentleman back then that decided to grow catfish in this lake over here. And he was one of the first catfish farms in California, and he did so. Since then, it's been sold to a company that has recreational. They have uh, RV park uh, here and here. And it's a big international RV um, company that has sites all over the United States for people to park their RVs and enjoy. So it's a fishing lake. People catch catfish. They catch large off bass. And then 
about uh, ten, five years, I guess it was about eight years ago, five years ago, eight, eight to ten years ago, they needed to double this highway. So I was involved in, in creating a plan uh, to where they could take more soil. This is a pretty big lake and they took all the soil out of here to build the overpass and to build all, this, all the things that they needed to do to bring it up uh, to the level they needed to. And so we built a fish farm here. This is all, it says about 100,000 pounds of channel catfish in it. Has a has a, a harvest bench here to where you can pull the nets and harvest things out. Uh, the, the owner of this property has rice and the water is used to irrigate the rice. This is in uh, taken in the fall when there's no rice. And then, um, and then we sell the catfish to the guy over here, that, uh, that, to the company that, that has the fishing lake. And so, so everything stays right here. Talk about local, you know. <laughs> and so uh, it's worked really well. And now they're actually, because of these, these, it's hard to empty this. It's kind of an ongoing type of stock and harvest type of situation. There's also forage fish that we grow in here. So the fish actually eat live fish that we have to feed them less. We manage this kind of like uh, you know an ecosystem, and the fish come out super healthy. Uh, the, the fish that are larger have super healthy eggs. Everything's good. So we started putting some 10-gallon milk cans in the shallows there, which the catfish lay their eggs into, and we collect them. And of course, we've got a lot of eggs, and so now this is turning into a seed stock nursery for the rest of the farmers in California. All done, you know, just from that project. Now we can add to it. We can make these into fish fish ponds here if we want. We can use, we put, we put a recirculating system on this property. We can use the water to grow sturgeon in uh, tanks and then we can put the water into this system to use. This, is, uh, this project is going to be uh, maturing as time goes on into more aquaculture production. Um, there's rice all around here. I mean, there's no lack of, uh, we can do the same thing. There's delivery systems through here that are already you know, uh, in place. So we can put water out on the rice all we want. And so, and there's several big ag wells here. The water table is about 30 feet. Didn't go down in the drought much. And so it's a really nice little site. Uh, supply and, supply and uh, security. This situation is this is a, a reservoir in Northern California with a dam. The water comes out through a delivery system for irrigation for the rest of the valley. It was built for storage, built for irrigation, and built for recreation, those three things. So what happened is the trout farm was built on the bottom of here, uh, actually in the 60s and 70s. And what's happened is this lake has, needs so many trout for the recreational uh, business that they contracted for the trout farm to supply it. And so they give them the water, they sell them the trout. And again, we're only a few miles apart. And then this person has, it's, producing recreational fish. It's codependent. You know, I need your water, I need your fish. Uh, shared watershed, everybody knows is on the same page as far as water quality and what is happening with there. The water from the trout farms used to irrigate crops and rice and all sorts of stuff after it's used. And then it's a secure market. This guy has, in addition to additional production that he has available, he has a, a set he can raise. You know, he's got, hun uh, he's got uh, tens of thousands of pounds of fish that just need to be delivered upstream. And another family. Uh, shared inputs uh, uh, and outputs is water, land, energy, nutrients, habitat, and crop. And you can see this little diagram is how agriculture and delivery can all be used in the same way. This operation is a geothermal water and it's used, it goes through these lakes and it's cooled down, reused, so they can use the super hot water, then they can put it down a little farther and lose a little colder water, cold water, and, and this water can be used for irrigation and other purposes after it cools down. So, um, it, and, and the water's open, this is in an area in nor far northern California where it freezes and gets cold. All this water is open for wildlife because of the warmer water and they can thrive in there. And so uh, it's a stopping point for a lot of uh, migration of, of birds that come um, north and south. And uh, so another really great example of how, how those systems get together. This one is uh, the uh, resource re rehabilitation. I was involved in, a, in 
changing some rice uh, fields into some fish production and how to protect them. And, the sa and what's going on now, we're moving in the direction of having salmon growing in there. The extra salmon from the hatcheries can be stocked. And then they just, whenever it floods, they just uh, disappear out into the uh, estuary, out into the waterways, and they contribute to the salmon population, all done naturally and uh, using those resources. This one is uh, uh, in Southern California, warm water fish farm with tilapia. These are all greenhouses here. They grow uh, Asian uh, vegetables, and it's a pretty big place. Uh, I don't know how many acres are under uh, the building, uh, under in greenhouses, but this water produces all the water needed for this in the Salton Sea area, and uh, and a, a good cohabitation there, and uh, really good operators and really clean product, and everything is uh, is useful. Uh, wetland mitigation. This farm here uh, provides all the water for this wetland in Central California. Hundreds of thousands of wild of of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, ducks and geese and all of the uh, uh, migratory birds stop off there. So. So anyway, these are the key points and in, in, uh, uh, in any kind of process and figuring out if you have a uh, if you have a site that you're looking at, the time to start is before you know after you build it and you go to your neighbor and say, do you want to buy my water? It's not a little late. They say okay. Well, or they say no, but where are you going to where are you going to put it? Begin with the investigative process. You know what do we need? Expose major areas of strengths, risk, and opportunity, and then determine the need for resource partnerships. Not every situation is correct. You don't want to force a situation that's not going to work, or try to make something work that's not going to work. Uh, but if 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 there's a need for it and there's a partnership, then then follow through. Build relationships uh, with those people. Uh, have them dinner, get together with their families, go on a picnic, tell them that you'll give them fish whenever you need, they need them, and uh, that way that partnership is is solidified, and those relationships are so hire their kids, you know, all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> then uh, get agreements in writing is step one. Don't you know handshakes have worked in the past and they're great to start with, but you need to have it tied down. What am I providing for you, and what are you providing for me? And what are those? Uh, keep it simple and just say, I'll do this, and you do this, and, and we'll be good. And then keep your promises after you start. Don't start to go back on those. And so, so those are the key points. I think uh, you can probably use your imagination in, 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 uh, in aquaculture on uh, brackish and salt water, but uh, that's what we've been doing for all this time. Been working great, and I think we've made a great computation contribution to producing food and a great contribution to uh, the environment and uh, to growing other food as well um, that we all enjoy in our great bounty of California. And uh, um, thank you very much. Thanks. And again, we're going to have lots of fun at lunch, uh, having some time to talk to each of the speakers. Uh, this speaker, I'm going to, I got to spend a second talking about him. So this is my first grad student ever um, uh, who went on, got his PhD, and is now back in a brand new faculty position at San, or Sonoma State University. Did his work right here in Elkhorn Slough, uh, and is now coming back. So it's just kind of fun to have him come back with enough expertise to come up here and be, be the expert um, on what's going on here, uh, especially in his understanding of the ecology of the slough. Um, and all these and various interactions, but he's also bringing an aquacultural perspective up to Sonoma State. So if any of you are working in that area, you know that you you have another another champion there to to help you get your stuff done. So so next up we've got Brent Hughes, who's currently at University of Washington and and now at Sonoma State. Sorry, um, aquaculture is a tool for restoring native oyster and understanding lost species interactions. Brent Hughes. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> You know, it's funny because Mike and I are working on this oyster project together, and we're both seaweed ecologists um, <clears throat> who have a really little understanding of oysters. Um, <laughs> but w the good news is we have a good team, and uh, <clears throat> they're helping us along. So if, there, there, if I could change the title of this, I would change it to Don't Forget About the Little Guys. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to be talking about the Olympia oyster, which is our native oyster. 
Supposedly, it's delicious, too. Um, <clears throat> I have, has anybody eaten a, yes. an Olympia oyster? Yeah. It's, it's pretty good? Yeah? Good? OK. Um, and it's all, so oysters, um, like this oyster here, it's a, considered a foundation species, which is an ecological term that we use for describing a habitat forming species that, in general, enhances the diversity of a system. And uh, the Olympia oysters often occur in these sh uh, shallow water embayments um, of estuaries along the Pacific coast. Um, and they, they provide this, this great structural habitat because they're forming reefs in soft sediments. Um, and these reefs can be nursery habitats for fisheries. Um, one, one example is Dungeness crab. Uh, and it's also nature's filter. So it can, um, <clears throat> before the water reaches the ocean, it can go through these oysters. Uh, the oysters can filter out contaminants and, um, <clears throat> and all sorts of nutrients and phytoplankters uh, before going out into the ocean. And it can also prevent uh, storm surge from, from eroding coastlines. So it, it does all these really important things. Um, <clears throat> however, this species is imperiled um, and it, it has a lot of threats. And here are some of them. These, these are the major ones, poor water quality, um, specifically nutrient runoff, leading to eutrophication or algal blooms um, that can cause hypoxia, which is a drawdown of dissolved oxygen in the water. And so when you have a hypoxic waters, oysters are forced to hold their breath for a long period of time. Uh, changes the fl freshwater flow, predation, especially non-native predators like European green crabs. Sedimentation is another big one that can have a negative consequences for oysters. Uh, competition such as in this photo that you see here, there's some competition going on. There's the oysters at the top, there's a non-native sponge, that orange stuff, there's all, Mike's ulva is there, um, all competing for that little bit of hard structural space. Um, <clears throat> and then there's these legacy effects from uh, European uh, colonialists who uh, over-harvested Olympia oysters. And because of all these threats, there's less than 1% of the Olympia oyster remaining in in estuaries. Um, <clears throat> and they've actually gone locally extinct in some of them, specifically Morro Bay. In Elkhorn Slough, our little native estuary here, um, there's less than a thousand. So we could actually go out in a day and count every single oyster in Elkhorn Slough. <clears throat> now, this threat of extinction presents a larger problem um, in that it creates this major gap. Uh, so if Elkhorn Slough eventually goes extinct, talking about hundreds of kilometers where native oysters will not exist. Also, you lose all that genetic diversity. And so um, <clears throat> most of you in the business side of things think about portfolios. Um, well, in, in nature and in ecology, it's great to have a good portfolio of, of meta populations or subpopulations. Um, this can provide resilience to the overall population and species. So we don't want to lose that. And we want to, we, we want to kind of bridge that gap and make sure Elkhorn Slough remains a, a robust, thriving oyster population. So how do you restore oysters? Uh, well, usually you put out some hard stuff and, and hope that things recruit to it. So on the left-hand side, um, that comes from the Living Shorelines Project in San Francisco Bay, um, which they're using artificial concrete structures to uh, provide recruitment sites for, for native oysters. On the right-hand side, you have Elkhorn Slough. Um, Elkhorn Slough's objective for overall restoration is can you, if you walk into the Elkhorn Slough, will it look the same as it did a thousand years ago? And because of that, they don't want to put out artificial structures. Uh, and they use these things called clam, clam necklaces, clamshell necklaces, that are native clamshells that provide the, the substrate for the oyster to recruit to. However, the question is, well, yeah, if you have that structure, it, pr it provides an attachment site for re new recruits, but there's all these, these things going on, these environmental factors that could prevent the oyster from ever even making it to that hard structure. <clears throat> and this is because it has a, a certain life cycle that is partly, uh, it's partly planktonic, and then it, it's partly uh, on the ground or benthic. And so, 
in, in the Olympia oysters, they produce sperm. The, the females take in the sperm and produce, uh, fertilize the e their eggs and produce embryos that they keep uh, for about seven to 12 days. Uh, and then they release them and they spawn and these pr produce the, the larvae that can float around in the water column for five days to four weeks. And so those, those little tiny plankters are, are swimming around exposed to all these environmental stressors. Um, and <clears throat> this is where we think a major bottleneck uh, can, can occur. So yeah, you might have some really nice substrate that you put out in your estuary, um, but without you know, the protection of these early life history stages, then you might have control restoration failure. <clears throat> so we're starting to ask the question, is aquaculture the solution? So can we bypass those environmental stressors by growing larvae in, in an aquaculture-like setting? So we're using the Moss Landing Marine Lab Center for Aquaculture to start to develop this program so we can help restore the oysters. And we're starting out with Elkhorn Slough oysters. And um, <clears throat> so it's a pretty simple design. We get our native broodstock, so we collect some of those 1,000 oysters that are left in Elkhorn Slough. Eventually, they'll release larvae. And then we put out our clamshell necklaces. Um, as you can see there, they're just strung down into the tank where the, the, the larvae settle. We allow them to grow for a month or two. And then when, once they reach a good size, we outplant them. <clears throat> and so in 2017, we ran a pilot because we're basically starting this project from scratch. And uh, <clears throat> it's probably the, the smallest, aqua, one of the smallest aquaculture projects in California. And that's on, it's not our fault because there's only a thousand oysters. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're, we're kind of tiptoeing this line of having enough brood stock, having enough oysters, but at the same time, um, not uh, threatening the existing population. And like I said, we want to take the adults from Elkhorn Slough because we want to maintain that genetic diversity. And so, surprisingly, we didn't know what to expect, but we had about 370,000 larvae, 500,000 larvae. Five minutes. Oh, in five minutes. Um, it, that, so they didn't produce 300,000 larvae in five minutes, but I have five minutes. So, and then they settled and grew um, at about six per shell, and in, but and unfortunately, in about two months, they died. And that's probably due to uh, uh, our, our, what we were feeding them. Um, their diet and so we've we've adjusted and we're we're going to redo that we're actually redoing this right now in 2018 we've had release we've had some uh, settlement and hopefully we're hoping to outplant and so what we're going to do is we're going to outplant to two different locations in the estuary uh, on the top or in, in this red it might be hard to see um, we're outplanting at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve and at sites where they currently exist and then we're trying a new strategy um, where we're looking at the lower part of the estuary where oysters once existed. Um, and there was a great paper Mark mentioned from the 1920s, McGinnity, that described a very thriving oyster bed um, in the lower part of the estuary. <clears throat> and we're coupling this with a restoration effort we did with seagrass, eel, the eelgrass Zosera marina, which we had a, quite a bit of a success. Uh, we plotted about 100 of these th this size of plots of, of eelgrass, um, <clears throat> and since then, um, about half of them have survived, um, and some of them have grown to a, a thousand percent of what they originally were. You can see them from space now. Um, so we're, we're using that experimental design to outplant the oysters to areas with and without seagrass, to harness the benefits of seagrass, because it's, it's, a, it's a great primary producer that um, produces more oxygen than it consumes, so it can actually buffer against lower pH. Um, and so we're, and it can also uh, uh, act as a predation refuge for uh, some of the predators that exist for the oysters. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, our Olympia oyster populations are under threat, um, and restoring these populations can um, uh, increase the, bio, the biodiversity of estuaries in California, and it can also restore some really important functions that have been lost. And we're thinking that actually partnering with aquaculture, aquaculture could be the solution for native oyster restoration. So I would like to thank 
all these people. Um, Kirsten, who is our local Elkhorn Slough oyster expert. Dan Gossard, who is the superstar grad student who's been um, raising these oysters. Jill Bible, who is our, uh, who is our oyster guru, um, because we're, we're dumb algae nerds. Um, <laughs> don't know much about oysters. Of course, Mike, um, Peter, who's also been helping with, and Max, who have helped and been raising these oysters um, over the last couple of years. And this was funded by the Anthropocene Institute. Thank you. We do got a second if anyone has a question for Brent while I queue up the next talk. Great presentation. Uh, I've been involved with the DC to Baja oh, okay. project, so uh, this, this is all really interesting. So I had a question about purposely pairing native oysters with eelgrass, yeah. and has there been resistance to that from the protection of the eelgrass side of, of the regulatory environment? No, well, not, not that I know of. And the, the whole idea is that there, these modules will be easily moved around. So the idea is that we use the early stages, in the, during the early stages of the oyster growth, after post recruitment, we place them in the eelgrass. And right now it's at the experimental stage. So yeah. we would have a pair design where the eelgrass is the eelgrass. And then move it, and then once they reach a certain size, move it to where we see them. So they, they can easily be they're mobile units, yeah. essentially. Um, and so, yeah, so far there hasn't been, but there's a lot of work that's been doing, been done, or it, and is being currently done with the non-native, the Pacific Oyster right. and the grass. And I don't think they've received any um, native feedback. So <laughs> we're, we're pairing two native species, which I think is a big concern. Right, there's, there are conflicts between Shellfish aquaculture and eel grass, and that's yeah. why I asked because yeah. trying to get at the ecosystem benefits, and I didn't know if, if your project with natives was going to be looking at some of the effects to eel grass, whether positive or negative. Could that yeah. you help further that I mean, ideally, yes. We were, so if, since we have an, ex, uh, an experimental design, we can look at an experimental design. Hopefully, tease apart negative and positive effects. Um, right now, yeah. This, this sounds like a great thing to talk about over oysters. Yeah. 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 I love it. <laughs> Paul, we're, we, we're going to move on. We want to keep it, it tight, but Brent is definitely going to be here um, at lunch to, uh, to discuss this project. And there's a lot of avenues. But I, I, I have the pleasure of introducing you to something that pretty much all of you will be hearing for the first time, which is quite exciting. And this is, uh, this is Mike Cox coming up. He's the founder and CEO of Anaerobe Systems, one of our partners up here in uh, Morgan Hill. And he's going to talk to you about new technologies for turning aquaculture waste, or resource, resource. regard, into biofuel and fertilizer. Thank you, Mike. So uh, I hope that's the last time we use that word, waste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, just a little background. I'm a medical microbiologist. And when I was working at Stanford in anaerobic microbiology, we, um, we identify anaerobic bacteria by what they eat and what they make. And, in this one book, it said this one makes a lot of hydrogen, this one doesn't make very much hydrogen, and this one makes really a lot of hydrogen. So I knew that anaerobes made hydrogen a long time ago. And when we had the first energy crisis, I said, well, I'm going to see if I can use anaerobic bacteria to make hydrogen. And I could do that from day one, but could never make any money. And, but I kept chasing it anyway. And one day, a former friend of mine was over when I was cleaning a fermenter, and uh, he looked at the stuff I was throwing away, and he said, can I send that out for soil analysis? And I said, sure. So this is what something like he picked up, and so he called me up uh, when he got the reports back, and he said, you know, I'm paying you $5 a gallon for that stuff you're throwing away. So this is, when we ferment, we get hydrogen and CO2 out the top, that's what sunlight put in, and so what's left in the fermenter is all the things the plants source from the soil, and it's already right ratioed. So this is organic fertilizer re ready to go. And it takes us 12 hours to go from the biomass to, uh, to this fertilizer. So we complete the compost cycle essentially in 12 hours. Um, so at any rate, uh, uh, a year or so ago, Mike Graham came up to see me and said, you know, I've got this strategy to clean up these, uh, these ponds uh, 
out in the farmland and I have a weed that will, I can grow there and, and it, it soaks up all the fertilizer and the nutrients in those ponds, but he said, I don't know what to do with the weed. And I said, I know what to do with the weed. So what we do then is, um, this is uh, uh, some hydrocotyl that uh, Ross Clark brought up to me. And it's just a really delicate weed, very easy to grind and process. So here we send it through our disintegrator and turned it into a mush there. And then I put it in the fermenter and we fermented it. And the next day, this is what it looked like. So now we've turned that, uh, that resource uh, into uh, an organic fertilizer. Uh, the one thing is we sterilize everything before we start. So all of this water that was originally in that pond that can't be used for irrigation, all of that water can now go back in as a liquid fertilizer. So all of that water is 100% conserved. Um, <coughs> so the, the other thing I've been working with, and I've fermented a lot of water hyacinths, uh, and this is, uh, the state of California took 2 million tons of this out of the Delta last year and dumped it on the ground and let it produce greenhouse gas. Um, I drive a hydrogen powered car and that two million tons would have filled my car a little over 700,000 times and made about $2 billion worth of fertilizer. And instead it was dropped on the ground to rot. So this, is a, uh, this weed does $120 billion damage to the US every year. And it could be turned into probably the largest dollar valued aquaculture project in the world. And it's just there for the taking. Uh, and, um, so this is Bangladesh, and literally this weed has taken the livelihood away from millions of people because they can't use the river anymore. They can't even drink the water. The fish are dead. Um, huh? Yeah, it grows up and then and dies, and then it, it eutrophicates the river, and you, uh, it's, all, it's all negative, except uh, if you uh, turned it into dollars. So here's uh, just some... <laughs> So I, I gave a talk at UC Davis a few years ago, and I, I said, you know, this is so profitable, we're going to end up with a water heist and depletion issue. <laughs> so there you can see I'm spraying it with 2,4-D and, and Roundup, and uh, I'm sure that's really good for water quality. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is both the hydrocotyl and the water hyacinths consume 10 times more water than evaporation, so that weed is a water thief. In a time when we don't have um, so one of the things is there's nothing that eats water hyacinths, and it has a whole lot of calcium oxalate crystals in the leaves, and so if an insect eats that, it will destroy their digestive tract. And you know what calcium oxalate, oxalate does to bigger animals is it causes kidney stones. So, um, and you can see those glass double-ended daggers there. Um, just a word on transpiration, um, you know, plants bring in the water from the roots and then uh, and it's a, a way of, of moving nutrients through the plant and that speeds up depending on how, how much potassium or phosphorus they need um, and then it goes out back out the leaves so in the terms of hydrocotyl which we're growing in those ponds transpiration is good because we want to get rid of that water when we're looking at the delta with water hyacinths, transpiration is bad because that's stealing our water. So, um, <clears throat> so this is again one of those ponds, and I calculated that's about 750,000 gallons of water, and that's uh, once we take it through this process, this sells between four and a hundred dollars a gallon. So, uh, go figure. So, <clears throat> in our Anaerobic fermentation process, well, the traditional anaerobic digesters, there's group A, which converts the carbohydrates into, um, into carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and organic acids. The group B take the hydrogen and carbon dioxide to methane, and in that step, you've taken a, a dollar and made it into a dime. And then the group C organisms convert the organic acids to methane, and in that step, you've taken a dollar and converted it into a penny. And uh, the group A's guys are done in about six hours, and the uh, group of C, B, and C take 20 to 30 days. Um, so we don't use group B or group C. And so we pre sterilize the substrate, and then we 
inoculate it with a single anaerobic microbe that has been pre-qualified to be the best organism to use for that bell pepper or water hyacinth or whatever it is. And uh, so we take uh, invasive species, different, I'm working with food processing plants. We have a lot of different anaerobes. We'll see which one does the best. And then uh, we uh, disintegrate the material. We pump it into a fermenter. And then we have a Siemens uh, TIA portal pr programmable logic controller that watches pH and pressure and temperature and controls all those components. And uh, again, uh, we're set up, uh, oh, here's a, let's see, just so you, why is that not working? Oh, that, it didn't. It, yeah, one more time, and then first you get it down here. Oh. Might take a second. Oh, well, normally you could see it bubbling. So we, we actually collect the hydrogen uh, in a column of water. Um, so this was an actual batch, and you can see uh, we inoculated here, and not much happened for about 10 hours, and then boom. So you can see this exponential up, ex exponential down. So now what we're doing is we're, we have a feed tank so that when the pH drops down to about 5, 6, we put in new feed and we wash out the acid to the next tank where we do a pH intervention. And that way we can run, uh, you know, 365 days a year without this. So you can see in this situation, in a 24-hour period of time, I only had four hours of work done. And the rest of the time was waiting for it to happen and then waiting for the next day to wash dishes again. So you really want to get it continuous. Um, so we're making about two-thirds hydrogen and one-third carbon dioxide. And then the organic acids I mentioned are primary plant nutrients, and we absolutely want to keep those because they're MREs for a plant, meals ready to eat. <laughs> um, and our end products are hydrogen, and the fact that we make the hydrogen locally or will be making the hydrogen locally will eliminate this truck because it'll be here. We'll just have to compress it. And we get a liquid fertilizer, and we get a solid soil amendment. <clears throat> you know about... 10 to 15 percent of a plant is lignin, and lignin is what makes humus. And lignin has a half-life of about 500 years in soil. So if you conserve that, you realize that 15 percent of every plant cycle, uh, or 15 percent of every plant cycle ends up being sequestered carbon for 500 years. And so that, that lignin is a really big com way of managing the, the carbon issue. The chemistry, which uh, sunlight, uh, I call photosynthesis hydrogen harvesting because chlorophyll gets enough energy from the sun to, to take a water and make six hydrogens and three oxygen. That's the investment step. Then we take the six hydrogens, hook it onto carbon dioxide and make glucose and, and release oxygen. That's a banking step. So sugar is nothing but a hydrogen storage device. And then we uh, ferment. Um, the sugar with anaerobic bacteria, and we end up making um, uh, four hydrogens, two acetic acids, and two carbon dioxides, and there's where we harvest the hydrogen. We take the carbon dioxide and hook it on potassium hydroxide, and we make potassium carbonate, which is the best potassium fertilizer you can buy, and we've sequestered all that CO2. Um, we take the acetic acid and react it with calcium hydroxide, and we make calcium acetate, I buy calcium acetate at uh, $80 a gallon to put on my tomato plants to stop blossom end rot. Um, and then uh, economic benefits, so each ton of this aquatic resource will do two kilograms of hydrogen and about 3,000 3, kilograms of uh, liquid fertilizer. We can get carbon credits, and the state of California will give you $3.25 for every kilogram of renewable hydrogen you make. Um, and uh, our process is 100 times faster than traditional anaerobe digesters. So it's, uh, you can see here, again, we're going from invasive weeds and ag waste to, um, through our process, we're getting hydrogen, potassium carbonate, liquid fertilizer, and a solid soil amendment. Uh, this is just a lawn behind my building, and three quarts of the fertilizer is added, and this is a month later. How do we use hydrogen? Well, this is a the car that I drive currently, a lot of forklifts are running on hydrogen, and uh, this is a uh, 
hydrogen powered truck that will be on the road next year. Anheuser-Busch just placed an order for 800 of them and they're switching their entire fleet to hydrogen powered. It's got a 1200 mile range and you, the hydrogen and maintenance is free for the first million miles. I, I, did, I ordered eight of those. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. All right, so I, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but obviously uh, there's a connection here, and, and we do have um, a graduate student who is working on her master's thesis here, utilizing Mike's system in conjunction with Mike and, and seaweed, um, which leads me to our next speaker, um, who is coming from Central Coast Wetlands Group here at Moss Lane Marine Labs, and it's uh, Ross Clark, and he is going to be talking about Aquaculture in partnership with terrestrial farmers. There you go, Mike. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give a brief history of our work over the last decade, working with the local farmers to address environmental challenges, and then um, spend a little bit of time on an opportunity analysis of how aquaculture could um, improve that partnership and actually make the um, environmental um, benefits that we've been working on cost effective in the long run. Right now we're a grant funded organization and thank you for everyone that voted for the water bonds. Um, but we'd, we'd like to um, work, find ways to make um, cleaning the environment, especially water quality, cost effective for our partners. Um, and as Mike said, we all have kids that are going to college, so um, uh, making money is becoming more attractive. Um, introduction to Monterey County agriculture. Um, farming in this county produces 76,000 jobs, um, $4.25 billion a year in production, which drives $8 billion of local economy. In Comparison, California aquaculture in 2010 was about 200 million. So you can see that here in Monterey County and throughout California, we spent 150 years investing, incentivizing, and encouraging agricultural um, development. And I think that that's, the, um, that's our, our job now, is to figure out how we can do um, aquaculture at some similar rate while also um, living up to our envi environmental ethics, which didn't always happen for agriculture in the first place. That's why our group is um, working with them now. Monterey County feeds the nation, um, local food su supply, many different crops. It's a great place to grow uh, agriculture. And, um, and farmers are already working to become more sustainable. But there are still challenges. Um, uh, you can see this lower Salinas Valley, uh, Moss Landing right there. Um, very intensive row crops. Almost all of the land has been transitioned from um, uh, habitat, wetlands, et cetera, into growing fields. And as part of that intensive um, operation, we have a lot of waste. We've, um, re uh, we have resource limitations as far as, well, labor now, um, water, um, uh, nutrients, etc. We have environmental impacts, and um, now the f um, the farming industry is uh, being challenged with uh, regulatory compliance. Um, for water quality, uh, most of the streams are impaired within the um, the Salinas uh, Valley for one or more agricultural related pollutants. The state regulatory uh, system is trying to encourage. Um, uh, the farmers to address some of this water quality issues and it's been a challenge for the farmers to become compliant. Um, there's um, the causal relationship between what the farmers have done and the environmental signal downstream as far as water quality goes has been really difficult to document. Um, and in addition, water resources are scarce. Um, most of our fresh water and 
uh, wetland and river habitat has been reclaimed for agriculture in, over the last 100 years. And groundwater aquifers are in overdraft. We're using more water than we have to grow these foods. So, so those are some of the challenges, which are also opportunities. And so that's where uh, working with Mike and Mike Cox, um, we started to look at how can we help address some of those issues from a market-based uh, standpoint. So our groups, uh, Central Coast Wetlands Group here at Moss Landing, uh, have been working with farmers for the last decade to um, reduce nutrients in uh, drainage water from farms before it gets to the um, natural environment. We're documenting the water quality benefits of this type of work. And now we're integrating these, um, these tools, these restoration projects, these treatment systems into different um, local plans. And we're working with the state to find regulatory credit for farmers that take these kind of actions. All of this is voluntary and grant funded. I'm now hoping we can actually integrate it into industry practices through um, um, actually generating a profit and uh, reducing regulatory headaches. So one of the projects we did in partnership with a farmer uh, handshake agreement is we put in a um, wood chip bioreactor which uses cell cellulose from wood chips as a food source for bacteria. The bacteria gobble up the nitrogen um, um, in the fertilizers from the runoff from the farms. Um, and expel it as nitrogen gas into the atmosphere. The water comes out the bottom uh, with very low nitrogen levels, which is what um, the uh, regulatory agencies want and why we worked with the farmers um, to construct the, um, this project. And we're talking real water, 76,000 gallons um, a day, or no, 144,000 gallons a day of water coming from a bunch of farms is being treated here. So. We're, act, we're making real downstream benefits to, uh, from this type of project. We're also uh, restoring wetlands in places that the far, are too wet to farm. So this is kind of um, unused portions of um, the lower Salinas Valley. This is a half mile down Highway 1. You can see it from the highway. And um, we finished restoration in 2017. And it's an 18-acre um, wetland. 12 of it is used for treating 1,000 acres of agricultural runoff. Um, and we, we're treating 80,000 gallons a day um, in this wetland. We've created great habitat, and we're, we're documenting 99% nitrate removal. Again, through, um, through anaerobic digestion, releasing that nitrogen as nitrogen gas into the atmosphere. We have, it's a great area for birding, um, and it, just a huge uh, uh, success, win, win, win. Uh, we're returning some of the lost uh, wetland habitats to the Salinas Valley. We're improving water quality, and now we're uh, going to the regional board and asking that the farmers that worked with us get that regulatory credit uh, because we can document that they've improved water quality and meeting the um, water quality objectives for the region. So. That's what it's in it for the farmers, is the regulatory relief and a bit of environmental cred in, uh, uh, as you know, one of the leaders helping those enviros um, you know, do some good stuff on the ground. Uh, we're providing them the data to document um, how well it's working. Here's, here's some uh, CSUMB um, uh, research from last year showing the nitrate concentrations float coming into our wetland and you can see it goes through a sinuous channel out toward the left and then back into the natural channel habitat of Casterville Slough. Picture of the system there. And you can see that this 18 acre wetland, uh, we're only using about 12% of it to uh, treat 1,000 acres of um, cropland. So we have plenty more treatment opportunities within this wetland um, and we're working with other farmers to Inc have their drainage flow into this as well. Um, and then we got lots of area as um, pristine habitat as well. Here's um, some transex um, nitrate uh, uh, concentrations going from the top of the wetland down to the bottom. And you can see um, during every time, we get pretty much to zero about halfway through uh, the wetland. And much of the, of the um, 
um, denitrification is happening in the first two acres. Uh, wetlands don't fit everywhere in, um, uh, in an agricultural setting, so we're also looking at other ways to remove nutrients from um, the water that can be put into channels um, that the farmers are already dug and maintained as part of their drainage system. So we have wood chip bioreactors here, again, heated and unheated, um, and we're looking at the nitrogen reduction of these different technologies um, in a replicated setting out here in Castorville. On the right is the hydrocottle channel where we're growing hydrocottle and then um, harvesting it and you know giving it to Mike. Um, I'll point out here that, oh, here it is. Um, right now, our penny wort or our hydrocottle, we're only seeing a 2% reduction in nitrate uh, from the water. So clearly, this system is not designed for optimal nitrogen uptake by this aquatic plant. And that's kind of one of the areas where uh, we're beginning to work now is how do we get similar nitrogen removal rates of hydrocottle as we do for some of the other um, uh, techniques. All of the, all of the um, different techniques we're using, the wetlands, the treat, um, bioreactors, et cetera, are releasing nitrogen into the atmosphere. The hydrocottle is the one that actually collects the, hydro, uh, the nitrogen within its biomass. Till now, that's not been very attractive because then the hydrocottle dies, releases the nutrients back into the water, and you've just uh, delayed that nitrogen load. Working with Mike now, he'll allow me to pick a bunch of it and dump it in his uh, driveway at his work, and he does really cool stuff with it, and now brought me a bottle of his liquid goo, which I can take to the farmer and say, here are your, nitri your nitrates back, you know? <laughs> you, you lost those, I, I got them, and we're, here they are in a form that they can actually use. And that's the opportunity I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, some of our research, we're doing cost-benefit analysis. Um, how much does it cost to, get, uh, to remove a certain amount of nutrients from um, a waterway? We, our bioreactor, it's $2.69 per kilogram of nitrogen removed over a 10-year period. Our treatment wetland is about a little more than that, three, uh, $3 plus. Um, but one of the things I want to instill in this dialogue um, today is we need to is that monetize, yeah, monetize the environmental benefits. Um, we, this is the cost to, to build and operate, but what is the benefit to um, the environment from taking this action? Um, well, we've shown the water quality benefits, and we're working with the state to credit the farmers that take it, and that, that's one way to monetize it is by reducing um, regulatory compliance costs. The other is, well, we just restored 18 acres of wetland, which, you know, grants are paying a lot of money to protect wetlands and restore them, and that wasn't part of this um, cost-benefit analysis. So if you include the, um, the benefits of uh, wetland restoration, you can drop the, uh, the cost of using wetlands as um, a way to um, clean water to below what it would cost for um, some of the other more engineered techniques. So that's our analysis to advocate for the benefits of restoring wetlands. I, I'm now looking to look at hydrocottle cost benefit analysis because we now have identified an actual economic uh, value to that waste product. So the, uh, my opportunity analysis. There are about 3,000 kilograms of nitrogen coming down the, the Castroville ditch that we now run into our treatment wetland and give off as nitrogen gas to the um, to atmosphere. And the Gavilon watershed that drains and goes right by us down below, we've estimated 300,000 kilograms of um, nitrogen as um, nitrates flowing through that system. If we captured all of that and recycled it, that would mean five to 10,000 acres or about almost you know, 10 to 20% of the Lower Salinas Valley, we could um, fertilize on an ongoing basis from our harvesting of um, a waste product um, directly um, downstream of those farms. Um, we're also interested in um, working with Mike to identify some of the nitrogen fixation, fixing properties of his um, hydrocottle goo 
And um, we're also, you know, looking at some of the other secondary benefits of using um, a water fertilizer for agricultural operations. Here's a picture of a hydrocodyl in one of our ponds. It just shows up. Our initial um, experiment, we, uh, we gave Mike uh, 32 kilograms of hydrocodyl. He ran two batches of 16 kilograms, um, and the product was um, half a liter of digestive molasses in about 74 um, liters of water, and it yields um, a final product of about 80 liters of fertilizer. And Mike, Mike has um, mentioned the, um, the valuation is very uh, broad right now, but one of our goals is to actually bring it back to the farmer and work with them so, um, to help understand how, in a high intensive farming um, area, how well um, this product can actually be utilized on their farms. I have another picture, um, didn't get it into the slides, showing one of the ag ditches directly upstream, um, which is our uh, source water, completely filled with hydrocodyl uh, for a mile and a half. They spray it with Roundup right now um, just to get, get rid of it. You know, if they knew that it was worth something, they'd have no problem scooping it up and putting, you know, putting it in um, our driveway. <laughs> um, so um, that's right where we're at. We're right at the beginning of trying to figure out. Um, we can grow it, we can capture it. How do we use it and how do we make it um, a viable uh, production uh, line that benefits the farmer, benef um, um, is cost effective so that we can continue to hire graduate students and actually generate the product. Um, so some of the questions, we need to isolate and incubate um, algae as well as the hydrocodyl as another source. And we're looking at some ulva that can grow in high nutrient, low salinity water, uh, trying to um, isolate that. We need to look at how to optimize the growth and nutrient uptake of these species. Um, we, want, uh, we want to maximize and standardize the nutrient content of the, the end products so that the farmers know what they're getting and they can integrate it into their um, fairly precise agricultural operations. Um, um, nitrogen fixation in the fields from the uh, biological activity, we need to quantify that. And then um, uh, what else besides this fertilizer can these byproducts be used for? And um, there are uh, many. This is from ag wastewater, so the food potential is nil, um, but there should be other um, uses for this biomass that we haven't investigated yet. Um, and there are costs and benefits associated um, with this uh, current um, um, strategy that we're looking at. Uh, there's production costs, there's fermentation costs, actually fermented energy inputs, transportation, um, um, uh, getting the product somewhere. We're hoping that we can get a larger digester here at the Marine Lab so that we can take a local product, digest it locally, and give it back to the farmers locally. Uh, but there are also benefits. We can, um, uh, we're working to monetize the water quality benefits. You know, what does it cost a farmer to be, um, to um, deal with the regulatory compliance issues, and if we reduce that significantly, um, that's a, the real savings to their operations. Um, fertilizer savings, you know, how can we have this supplement or um, uh, exchange for their current um, nutrient uh, purchase um, and those costs? And um, we're using non-productive lands. These are drainage ditches or um, you know, low wet areas that the farmers don't use anyway. So this is, this is maximizing um, the value of their properties. Um, and we're, we're cleaning the water, which may lead to it being able to be uh, recycled um, for uh, agricultural operations, which may re actually reduce our overdraft situation. And another benefit is no permits are needed. I mean, this is on a farm doing agriculture. You know, um, they don't get permits to do um, to do what they do. And um, in fact, we're actually going to be hoping to reduce the permits they do have. So, you know, here's a, a great opportunity that I'm glad to be working with a lot of people in this room to investigate. And hopefully, in a year or two, we can come back and say uh, that we saved the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob.
All right. Well, let's see if I did this right then. Tried not to give you too much of a lead in, um, but the way we organize this session, starting off with Tony, <coughs> me. starting off with Tony talking about cohabitation and diversification of the ways you cohabitate aquaculture um, as well as agriculture. We didn't quite define aquaculture, right, which the definition basically is the controlled production of an aquatic organism for commercial gain, okay? That's, that's a nice broad definition that allows us to creatively think about how to do so um, in, in these discussions. And so um, I, I, we, we then talked about you know, how we've got oyster work that can be done in, in a creative way. Again, those oysters aren't necessarily being sold. Um, but there's usually resources for restoration and conservation, which is what Brent was really talking about happening right here in the area. We heard um, from Mike giving you a, a really creative way to use these resources, right, um, for commercial gain in, in ways we value, right? We, I, I thought it was quite fitting when Ross said, you know, he hands the bottle right back over to the farmer. He is, you guys, they've repackaged their fertilizer that would go straight into Elkhorn Slough, and, and there's science going on as to whether it helps promote harmful algal blooms and, and what the consequences of eutrophication are and the epiphytes that grow on the eelgrass. I mean, there's all the stuff that goes on with that. Yet, as you clean that water in a way that farmers can appreciate, they're farmers still, right? You're dealing with, this is farming. It's culturing. They, they understand it, they appreciate it, um, and they can, they can accept it. So I, I'm just trying to put this together for you. This is all novel for us here. We've been thinking about it for years, but we're now to the point where the science has caught up um, with, uh, with, with our ideas, and we've got some proof of concept here. And so I want to kind of put you back out at where we were, right, which is, which is now California, and we're thinking of the diversity resources. I mean, this is the salad bowl of the planet right here in Salinas Valley, right? And, you know, we heard earlier about how how the sanctuary, you know, has opportunities for aquaculture. We still have to get through state through state um, challenges first, but that the sanctuary is not, you know, it, it, there's there's no closed door to be doing aquaculture in the sanctuary. Obviously, we've got we've got programs already working. We talked about the history of the area. We talked about how the state interacts with them. And so, when you bring us now down to this scale, and you think of the Salinas Valley, and you think of artichokes, and you think of strawberries, and you think of Pinot Noir, and and you think of the services that go on in the ag sector, and you think of what made Salinas what it is, and what made Salinas Valley what it is, and the, the expertise for dealing with agriculture here that we export around the planet, you know, and, and you think about the watershed, which is, you know, this entire area, and for those of you who don't know, the Salinas River actually flows north from all the wine regions in the south up into Salinas, um, which is that big concrete blister right there in the middle, um, and, then, and then all the rest of the land all around, and you think of, of the water that goes into this and, and our livelihoods and the agricultural families that are here and the education that goes on. And then, and then you, you bring it in a little closer to the sanctuary and the bay. And I'm going to bring you a little closer to the old Salinas River and the Artichoke Farms and the Lettuce Farms and the Moro Coho and the Corn Slough. And then I want to bring you a little closer. You're all sitting right here. This is our seed farm here. This is the Bari. This is the Slough again. You can see the Phoenix Hill Bend. And, and then you start to see some other things pop up. An enormous amount of green water flowing through the Morocco, which is obviously being driven a lot by nutrients. And does anyone know what this is? That's Big Mo, one of the largest power plants, the most important power plants in the area. basically CO2 from the process of doing so. It brings it over to this facility, which is the Moss Dining Commercial Park. Those are seven, one part of seven, five million gallon tanks that are concrete. It's a derelict facility from a previous project in the area that drew in seawater and evaporated the water to process to make uh, coal kiln bricks, bricks that basically line coal kilns. Um, and it was a natural refractories project. It's now owned by a private owner. There's a lot of industrial space. And they draw the water is drawn in from the harbor, which is the mixing point for this yummy water and that yummy water. And I, you should be seeing the, the 
genesis of ideas on how cohabitation right here, right now, with these existing technologies that are being thought of creatively with a group of entrepreneurs, a group of NGOs, a group of investors, scientists, regulators, and you think this, this kind of looks like the really cool picture I love from Tony where they're water skiing on one end, they're fishing on the other end as they come through the rice paddies and the water reclamation, and you can see, I think, somewhere hovering about 10 feet above us, this idea that cohabitation could possibly work here and redefine a little bit about how we think about aquaculture and redefine how we think about agriculture and get us to think a little bit more about what our friend Wayne Porter said yesterday as we need to think about how these processes integrate and think that maybe Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary could be a site of demonstrating this and, and could be an area where when this builds out, you now need new services. You need this, this hybrid service between aquaculture and agriculture that can spawn out of this area the same way the services and the, the, the intellectual property that came out of Salinas Valley for ag can come out of the same region for aquaculture. And as you think about that, then I hope you flip it around again and step back. And step back and look at the region and step back and look at the state and realize Google Earth it. Look, you can't just Google for concrete, but I did. I basically took a one mile filter and ran from San Diego to Humboldt looking for these derelict facilities. You see them, they're old sewage treatment plants. The water quality, and they run from, pump from Arcadia all the way down to San Diego. And where are they usually at? They're usually at estuaries. They're usually near farmland. They're usually near car plants for all the reasons we've heard. So, you know, my talk was supposed to be. Is there a possibility? Yeah, there's the pot, and this fits with what we're talking about. It fits with local, it fits with California values, it fits with exporting our expertise while demonstrating the usefulness here for us. I mean, the project going on uh, that, that went up at, in Samoa, up by Humboldt, is an excellent example of how we've tried to do these things, and, and we need to try to do them more often. And, and I, I hope, at least it did for me, because you can kind of feel me getting excited, that it twists the way I thought of aquaculture. It twists the way I thought of resource use, and it, and it just adds, it not only does it diversify, it makes it more economically feasible to do this. Um, and then I think at that point, we start to do that. And we start to think about the regions along the world where others are doing this. And sometimes they're forcing it. They're forcing it situations where it's not as natural, where it doesn't stand out, and yet we're sitting here in California and especially in Central California, with the nexus of all these issues showing up at these areas where this cohabitation work can be extremely valuable. And that's what I want to leave you with. Um, and I, I just want to have it in your brain to think yourselves as entrepreneurs, yourselves as regulators, a, a, as running NGOs, as media, wh whoever you are, that this is another thing. This isn't what we're going to do for aquaculture in the state. This is, I'm not proposing that we do this and that's all we do. I'm just proposing that it's something we do now and, and it will help us with that social license because with this comes an amazing story. And, and you get people in the mud and then you get them in Ross's, in Ross's um, uh, incubate, in, in, in his bioremediation systems and then in an oyster bed and then you drive them there, well probably not in Mike's truck, but you know, in a hydrogen powered car and you make it real for them. And, and, and this is only one way to do it. There's other ways to do this. There's other, people have been making fertilizer and, and other biofuels out of us. Mike kind of led you through you know, the group B and group C, but it's an idea. And, and it's just an idea I want to leave you with, and I'm done, but uh, well, I'm done. Thank you for, for listening. <laughs> But I want to introduce um, our friend Mike Murphy, and what he's going to do is he's going to, he's going to close up this morning for us, and he's going to lead us um, into the afternoon. Excellent. Also, uh, Aaron Axelrod is going to say a few words as well. I just wanted to give a really quick plug-in. Again, I see the fog is lifting right on schedule. It's going to be another beautiful day here on the Monterey Bay Coast. Some of you might be like, wow, this has been a really intense day and a half. Maybe I'm going to cut out a little early. Well, this is another plug for the afternoon session because a lot of the things that we've been uh, hearing about, it's been a ton of information, but the afternoon session is going to be much different. If you notice on your agenda, 
not a lot of names on there, and that is intentional. The afternoon sessions after lunch are going to be much more about dialogue, hearing from you, and the kinds of people that you're going to hear about are the exact kind of people that uh, John Finger, when he was talking about when he started out with just the five acres and two people, you're going to hear a lot from folks that are trying to start out just like John did all those years ago. And the joy that the process that they're going through, but also the struggles. And then we're going to transition into the really fundamental question of what's next. And we want to really hear from all of you, if you're so inclined, about how we actually make that happen. So I hope we stick around after the fabulous lunch that's going to be out there. We've got more oysters going on. We are obviously doing something right so far because I see some faces that weren't even planning on being here today decided they needed to come back and talk about all the stuff that we need to do to make the what's next happen. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Erin Axelrod, and she's got a few things she wanted to say. Yeah, thank you for that. I just wanted to, again, really, really honor the sponsors, um, the Hog Island Oyster Company. They weren't, their logo wasn't up there, but it should have been. Incredible, incredible gift of nourishment to all of us. I want to thank all of you, too, for your time coming out, spending two days, and sharing your wisdom and intellect and um, you know, collectively paying attention to where this movement is going. And um, also, I wanted to say that Salt Point Seaweeds, who um, wasn't able to be, I, I wish they were able to be on a panel discussion today. They're another one of those um, up and coming enterprises. They contributed seaweed salad for us today to enjoy. Um, so that's uh, what Kame from Wild Harvested from their um, operations. And um, right before, when we come back together, you'll also hear a little bit from the Sustainable Design Masterclass. Um, they'll say just a few words. Raleigh will say a few words about his work um, and, and honoring all of your work as well. Um, and just to echo what Mike said about um, the goals for this afternoon, I really appreciated, Mike Graham, how you just queued up for us. I think one of the critical things that I'm curious about is um, I feel one of the goals that we had around this event was really what is a coalescing vision around where we go from here, this what's next question. Um, and so the interactive dialogue that we're hoping to catalyze this afternoon is really meant to help us continue to develop our shared literacy around where there is alignment around that collective vision for what we can do together. So I do hope you'll stick around. And again, thank you to Hog Island, Salt Point Seaweeds, um, and Sustainable Design Masterclass uh, for all the work that they've done. And um, I got to put another plug in for Luke uh, and all his work to put this together. So thank you and enjoy this lunch. So, lunch is the same as yesterday in terms of rules and regulations. Um, however, the classroom is not being utilized today. So, if you're so inclined and you'd like to walk to the end of our building and look at our scientific posters that the students have put up on the walls, feel free to do so. Please stay out of the, out of the laboratories, right? But we do have a lot of interesting information on the walls. So, be happy. there's also another restroom down there as well. All right.